Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 43 of the Former Action Guys podcast, and I'm your host, Justin Kramer. This week, we have author Garrett Jones on. He is a former soldier in the uh, in the UK Army. He uh, did two deployments to Iraq in the Basra area, did one to Afghanistan, uh, south of Musa Kela, and then when he got out, he was doing private security contractor working on ships that were going through the uh, areas of the ocean or of the areas that had pirates and stuff like that. So he did some contract work. Like I said before, he's also an author. He has 10 published books, um, some under Penguin and some under, uh, he's self-published. He's also the host of a podcast and everything. So great conversations. We talk about all kinds of stuff ranging from his time in the military to kind of the certain, the restrictions that are happening now and kind of the government overreach and stuff like that. If you're not interested in hearing um, a lot of COVID-19 details i would jump about 40 minutes ahead in the podcast and then we kind of talk about it a little bit less but the first 30 or 45 minutes is mostly covid 19 and kind of what's been happening around here how like a, in malibu a paddleboarder got arrested because he was out in the middle of the ocean by himself and you know whatever so we we discuss about or we talk about a bunch of stuff like that so anyway make sure to uh as always if you're not gonna if you're watching this video if you're not watching this video make sure you subscribe to the former action guys podcast youtube channel if you haven't already uh give a like and leave comments under your favorite episodes i'd also like for you to leave a review if you're listening on apple Podcasts because it's uh one of the only platforms that allows reviews and it also lets people know that haven't checked out the podcast that they can that it's a good show right now i think we're sitting at 59 five-star reviews so let's bump that up to at least six get over that 60 number get closer to 100 to be awesome and then finally make sure to check out my website jkramergraphics.com and uh, my instagram page at jkramergraphics that's jkramergraphics.com and at jkramergraphics on instagram and you can also email any questions you have to uh, former action guys podcast at gmail.com so really good episode i hope you enjoy it and i hope everyone's staying safe out there yeah unfortunately i, I couldn't find anywhere with great with great light in here unfortunately so it's it's about as good as it gets. It's not like a, we got a great balcony and stuff here, but then if you go near there, it gets too bright. Yeah. And then the rest of the house is just is all it's quite narrow, so you can't really get far enough back from a camera. <laughs> nah, it looks good though. It looks fine. So, are were were you planning on staying here this long, or did you kind of get trapped here? So I was supposed to be for six weeks. So I suppose I was originally planning on leaving on the first of March, but then what happened was my friend um, who's a DJ, he was like he. He announced a tour where he was going to tour around California, Arizona, you know, and I was like, fuck, I'll come along on that because I do the warm up DJing for him. Mm -hmm. So I planned to stay out here, but um, I was, you know, I was supposed to be out here fucking DJing, not staying in the apartment. Yeah. But then, but then it got to the point where I was like, well, I don't really want to travel now because like the only old people I know are all in the UK. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't give a fuck if I get here because I'm not going to pass it. The only person I'm going to pass it on to is my friend Ryan, who's fucking 20-something, 20 28 years old or whatever, you know, I'm going to yeah. pass it on to him. I like, so, but I got a, I got an email off the, um, like, customs and border border people last night, basically saying, like, hey, hope you've had a good time in the States. Remember, you've got 10 days to get the fuck out. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, like, this is ridiculous. It's like they'll they'll put restrictions on people to not go paddleboarding. Yeah. But then, like, because I understand them not wanting people staying here and working. Obviously, I understand that. But it's like, Dude, I'm in the apartment all day. I'm paying rent. I'm fucking. I'm paying rent. I'm fucking ordering Uber Eats. I'm putting money into the economy. Yeah. What difference? What difference does it make if I stay here another fucking two months? Yeah, are you? You're slowly trying to migrate here. Yeah, but instead, dude, I've got to fucking go through two international airports to get home. Like this is retarded. Yeah, it's a weird moment. But they'll arrest people for paddleboarding. That's a crazy. That, you saw that meme, man. That I saw the video of it. They actually like the dude was like trying to paddle towards a pier, and the <laughs> the police boat came around. Then a second police boat came around and kept him from coming up to the beach. They stopped him and then picked him up. I'm like, what? Like, God, that's such a like what a waste of time and assets. Also, such a PR move. It, not a good one though. That's a shitty PR move. It's a good PR move. Like, hey, nobody depends how you think though like you, yeah. you you and i think that way um i've been getting so infuriated with comments from people saying that like oh if people are caught this weekend they should lock them up and throw away the key <laughs> and all these kind of stuff yeah. like i don't usually use the word cuck but like those people are fucking cucks <laughs> like I'm, I'm all about people staying in and like you definitely do everything that they're saying the social distancing and stuff like that but to say that someone that's out on a paddleboard by themselves in the ocean yeah is somehow doing something wrong. Yeah. And what are they going to do? They're going to they had him handcuffed too, which was crazy. 
they're letting people out of jail here in California because yeah. of the virus. So are they going to turn around and put that dude back into jail? And where, where was that? It was in Malibu, right? Yeah, it was Malibu. It's ridiculous, dude, because I'm, I'm, I'm agree. Like, I, I've been spending most of my time in the apartment. I've yeah. not been going. I've not been going out. I've been ordering my food in rather than go to the grocery store. Um, and like at most most days, I'll go walk down the beach at low tide because you can walk down at low tide and keep your distance from people and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, but I think like I have a fundamental issue with somebody being stopped from fucking paddleboarding on the ocean. Like that's that to me is like they're they're massively overstepping the, yeah. the boundaries. Um, you know, it's just, I don't know. Are we recording right now? Have we started or are we? Yeah, are I mean, we, it's it's going the whole time. I'll cut it to whenever. Okay. I, th- um, I mean, if yeah, you're good I, with all this, I'll put all this of it in. Yeah, there too. I'm, I'm, I'm good with all this, dude. I fucking want to talk about this stuff because it's... Um, it's pretty wild. It's um, Did you see the Queen's speech today? No, I, I, I haven't. I've got a feeling that I'm going to get pissed off. <laughs> it was <laughs> more so, it was more so like, hey, everyone, you're doing a good job. Like, thank the heroes, you know, like showed some pictures of the medical workers and first responders and stuff. Uh, she talked, she talked about how, you know, she had to, her and her sister had had to make a recording in like 1940. That was the first time her and her sister had been on recording. And it was like as the buildup for world war two or world war two mm. timeframe for you guys. Yep. It, it wasn't that bad. It was kind of like, okay, you know, it was kind of like, yeah. Hey, we're going to get through this kind of, you know, everyone, yeah. well, it's cool. going to suck. Like it's going to suck, but let's get through this. And that's kind of, I'm, I'm glad leadership is being like that. They're like being realistic with it. Um, well she is, but then on the other side, you had the, I think it was the British home secretary basically coming out and saying, stay home this weekend that we're going to put more harsher restrictions on you. Oh, I'm really? thinking like, yeah, I'm what, like, I'm not what are like, the restrictions in the UK right now? I think it's basically the same as it, like the social distancing, like not, not essential, non-essential businesses closed down. I hate that term, non-essential business. Yeah. Because it's like, well, um, I, I, I like how they say certain things are essential. Like some of the things that are essential, you know, I'm like, are they essential? You know, like Best Buy was open for the longest time. You know, they were, they just went to where you can do curbside pickup, but they're still open and stuff like that. And yeah. it's like, I'm all about keeping the economy open, but it's funny how I just think it's funny how they dictate, like the government's dictating, like, Hey, your business has to close, but yours can stay open. And, yeah. and people are like, wait, the weed shops can stay open, but my, you know, whatever thing over here can't because it, you know. Yeah. Like they, like, I think it's uh, vape shops have to close, but you can have tobacco stores open and, oh, all really? for, and things like that, dude. I, I'm all for like, again, I'm all for close. I'm all for being sensible with this shit, dude. Like I said, I'm fucking, you know, because I get pissed off with people who are like, oh, so you're just out all the time going around and hanging out. I'm like, no, I'm in the apartment on my own 90% of the time like, because it's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But if you put, if you put out the right information, most people will, will comply with, with that, you know, with the information. With the, what I have a problem with is then punishing people who don't because a lot of the times, you know, like, you know, people are saying, you know, you go out, you get someone else sick or whatever. And that's, that's, that's true. But um, I know myself, if I don't get outside, how quickly my mental state goes down. Yeah. Um, and, and it's like, so do, do, does my health not count? You yeah. Know, or does the health, because yeah, I have mental health and all good, that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm lucky here, dude. We got a balcony with a, with a view of the ocean. So I'm quite very lucky. Mm-hmm. There's some places where I've lived where it's been, you know, a, a fucking shoebox sized apartment with no way of, you, know, you can't even open the windows fully. That's not healthy for you to stay in there all the yeah. time on your own, dude. There's a reason they put solitary people in solitary confinement to fucking punish them because it's such a horrible thing to fucking go through. Yeah. So when, when they're doing that to people, I'm like, I have a real problem with that because it's like, look, yes, there is an issue, um, but there's like, we haven't hit pause on all the other fucking medical mental health issues just because there's this COVID. There's still all the other things going yeah. on too. And so I actually was listening to uh, a podcast earlier today and there was a doctor from the University of San Francisco and he was saying that they, like all or most, I think most hospitals went to like, hey, no non-essential surgeries. We're only focusing, we're setting up and getting ready for this to happen. And in San Francisco, it didn't come to fruition. So a lot of the hospitals are starting to bring in different levels of surgeries now, like starting to phase down where like, Hey, we're not doing anything like this hasn't hit like we thought it was going to. So it's starting to phase down, which is good. I mean, that's a good, that's good news to hear. Hopefully, hopefully New York and uh, I think Michigan right now is kind of bad. I think the few places that are bad, hopefully those are isolated like as much as possible. New York. I mean, it's just, God, there's so many people I've never been, but it's just, I've been to Hong Kong and I've heard Hong Kong and New York are really similar. I I see that. I can see that. 
you know so yeah you can't you can't distance yourself because like you fucking but again it's one of those where um those aren't like most people in new york are living in tiny tiny fucking places Mm -hmm. it's just like it's just not good for your fucking head to be stuck into those places we're not supposed to be we're not supposed to be separated and we're not supposed to be indoors like those are two things that human beings are not supposed to fucking be yeah you know that's why prison is fucking that's why prison scares people like is why why a lot of people get put off doing crime because they don't want to be locked in a fucking box on their own you know yeah that sucks that you're spending your time here in the u.s I'm making the most of the apartment, you know? Yeah, I'm getting right into it. But look, dude, I'm fucking like, the sun's shining outside now. Once we finish this, um, this afternoon, I've got a bit of writing to do, and then I'm going to sit outside, and I'm going to get fucking drunk on the balcony while looking at the palm trees. So There you go. Like, but I'm in a good good position, dude, to ride this out, because I work from home. Yeah, Um, exactly. I've been been telling people, I'm like, you're kind of seeing what I do every day. Like, this is kind of, you know. How about you though? Because I actually find it, I'm actually finding it harder to work now. I have to be in the house. It's, yeah, it's, I'm actually finding it harder. Um, I'm the same. It's it's super. Well, it's I'm the same, but I'm also I'm a maniac, man. I I have a hundred things going on at one time. Like I do, I, I've got the podcast. I have a website. You know, I'm in school, taking five college classes right now. <laughs> and, you know, I got all this stuff going on, and I keep like, well, I could do this too. Like I keep like, oh, I should do this as well. Um. So I'm just kind of naturally overwhelmed constantly yeah. from all my projects that I keep going, but it does suck. It what I think it reminds me of being on ship when I was doing deployments on ship. Yeah. Yeah, you I have bet. to you have to go outside like you have to force yourself if you don't think about it. You know, you get to a point where you don't really think about it, but you have to get outside and get sunshine. Yeah. Like it's yeah, just, I, I I I did the security on the ships, like private security on the ships. I I, I totally agree, dude. Like yeah, um, I feel I feel I feels very much like that. What but, was that? What was that like doing private security? When when were you doing that? Um, well, when I got out of the army, so 2011. I did. Yeah. I did it 2011. I did my last jobs in 2016. Okay. Um, I kind of. I, I did like. I did quite a lot in 2012, um, 2013, 2014, and then like 2015, 16. I just did like jobs here and there. Were those Were those the years when it was like getting really bad for shipping over on the? I uh, think. Horn of the, Africa? I think it peaked. I think the peak was like 08 to 10. That was kind of the peak. So when I started doing it, there was still like a fair bit of piracy. Like there was quite a lot. You'd get like a lot of reports of it. But yeah. then there was it was almost like a surge in Iraq. There was like a surge of security teams. Yeah. And then it and it and then so it dropped quite rapidly. But then they also started doing the navies came in and started doing these like counter piracy operations. Um, and then it dropped off. And then it dropped off very, very quickly. And then West Africa. West Africa became the thing then with the Nigerian piracy. But that was different because we couldn't be armed on that. You'd have a team of local – you'd basically be a consultant and you'd have – so they'd um, – the shipping company would like I, – I imagine they'd pay the government and you'd get these uh, – like I think it was like you'd get eight local guys like who were local Navy guys mm-hmm. or Army. I have no idea what they were because they spoke French and I don't really speak French to that degree. <laughs> that was great. It was one of those jobs to turn up and you go and speak to the team like your local team. Yeah. And then you realize you don't speak the same language. You're like, well, this is going to be fun. So I was, I'd had, um, um, I, I would just be like texting. I would be texting. I like key phrases. I text home and get them to send me the translation off. So at least I could try and get back and forth in, in that, in that capacity. But yeah, that was, I didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy not being armed. I, I don't like being un- unarmed in a situation where other people are armed and bad guys are armed. Yeah. It's, it seems like a really shady situation. Oh, it sucked because like my first, <laughs> like the SOP for me was like, um, you know, actions on actions on pirate attack. First thing I had to do, steal a weapon from one of the guys on my team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <You> know? <laughs> and then go from there. So yeah, it, 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 it wasn't great, but they were, you know, they were the fucking, it was a, it's a classic situation. I'm sure a lot of the listeners have been through if they work with locals, you know, just trying to get them to keep a fucking clean weapon is... Yeah. They don't really like, understand fundamentals of a lot of stuff. Flip flip flops, patrolling flip flops on their <laughs> weapon weapon in their cabin. I was telling it's my fun. buddy, I was telling my buddy, I was like, I feel like they're just exactly like a hundred years behind us, you know, well, except for like where it comes to cell phone technology. Beyond everything else, though, it's like a hundred years beyond behind everybody else. Like I always wondered, like I was always wondered, like how the fuck did the British Empire get so big? And then you kind of see like how unprofessional they are now, and you're thinking like, oh, that's how. Like yeah. I, I always feel like I, I always feel like if you turned up to some of these countries in Africa with a fucking battalion of Marines or a battalion of British Army soldiers, you could be running that country in a week. 
You know, it, I really, I really believe, you know, I really believe that. It's like, there's just, it, it's, have you ever seen like Iraqis trying to do star jumps? And stuff? Yeah, that just, was videos, it's just, yeah. It's, it's just nuts. It's like, there's, there's just seems to be this real, and I'm not trying to get into like, I'm not trying to tread like racist territory here, but you know, the physical, like physically, why physically Westerners have developed, like not in all cases, like obviously you sort of see some big African lads around when you're in Africa and stuff. Like some of the, some of the, like the guys you see when you're in Africa, uh, you're just like, Jesus Christ, they just look like gods. <laughs> but like, but in the Middle East, they're malnourished most of the time. They've grown up in like really shitty environments. They've had to cope with like a lot of diseases and stuff that don't even exist in our countries really anymore. Yeah. Um, and like, we, I think we take it for granted just how like strong we are in comparison. Like, there's no way those guys could hump the kit and stuff that you know that we do. Yeah. They'd be dead. Like, if you ever, like, I've seen them in patrol bases, like trying to just pick up, you know, just like an easy bar that someone's doing kills with. They're trying to deadlift it. They can't get off the floor. It's nuts. Well, Americans, I know Americans. I don't. I'm not sure about British, but I know Americans have um, like their average size has just like exploded since commercial farming and stuff took off and like food was rapidly available like after the great depression and everything like that when mm-hmm. kind of everything came online it's well you guys uh, are the biggest it, you, you guys are the big you guys like as a nation now i've got probably the big you know like uh the biggest size wise yeah maybe maybe fattest i don't know about tallest i think tallest well, I think would Mexico, be like I russian think- or something like that no, no, Russians, because again, dude, like Russia is like fucking a lot of the parts of the country, you know, they're pretty malnourished yeah. uh, in like in like a lot of Russia, yeah. But, I mean, been. obviously, you get like, um, you, you know, so you get your outliers and stuff, like in Sweden and Norway, you get like a lot of tall people. But in America, as far as like really athletic people go, like sometimes if you go walking around Santa Monica or something, you'll just see like a dude, you'll see a dude who's like 6'3", jacked, and just be like, fuck, guy's a specimen. Like you just, you don't well, see that many people like that in the UK. California is California is a different sample of people. For sure. Yeah, for uh, sure. You know, people people live how their environments. People in the Midwest are bigger because you know they live through harsh winters every year. So they're yeah. just naturally like a lot of people there are just yeah. bigger fucking people. You know, um, well, and then so people on the coastlines are all in good shape and everything like that. It's just I don't know. Yeah, we were saying the other day because I went down the beach the other day and you've seen like so many people out running and stuff. So many people running, people surfing. Super healthy area for sure. Yeah. And I think that's it's great because it's you know I just drove across to Chicago recently. One of my friends he left the Marines, relocated up to Chicago. We drove across the country, and um, it was when we started hitting like Nebraska and places. You go into the yeah. gas stations there. I was like, ah, oh, here's the fatties. Like, here's here's like, America. I was like, I was wondering where you guys were, but I like those. But I, I like those, those are my people, too. man. <laughs> I was really I was really like pissed that um, this whole thing happened because. I, I was really looking forward to like, because as it was, we were in the car, we check in the hotel, we're in the hotel room, we're in the car. You know, that's, um, again, it was, I was getting fucking pissed off with people because I had people DMing me like, what the fuck are you doing going across the country? It's like, it's two of us sitting in a fucking car in the Rocky Mountains on our own. It's like. Dude, how great is the Rocky Mountains? Uh, it's one of my favorite places in the world. It's, it's incredible. So how is it as a foreigner getting an opportunity to drive cross country in America and just seeing the, like the vast diversity, you know, that we have and just like not, not only people, but like climates and, you know, geography and stuff like yep. that. It's just crazy. Well, one thing I'd say, a lot of people said this to me actually, is that I've probably seen a lot more than America than most Americans have. Yeah, true. Because I, I really make the effort to see it when I'm out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Utah is probably my favorite place. Utah, that, that area of like Southern Utah, Northern Arizona, Mm-hmm. around that kind of like monument valley those yep. places dude it just fucking blows my mind when I, I drive through those places i'm thinking about taking my kid camping up there actually here like in the next oh, week or two because this is all going sick. on there's blm land out there out by bears ears um What's BLM? The, BLM, uh, it's the bureau of land management so in the midwest or not in the midwest there's really none east of the Mississippi, but to the west of the Mississippi, like in all the plain states and stuff like that, there's huge patches of land that are Bureau of Land Management land. And that is like your land or Americans' land. Um, yeah. It's it's managed by the federal government, but you can go on that land and do all kinds of stuff. Like I go out there and camp and you can, you can just go camp and do whatever you want out there. But people... A lot. The thing that it's used mostly for, or I think probably the most, pro- yeah, probably the most, is people put their cattle out there to graze. So, like, when I yeah. went out camping on BLM land, you know, there was no facilities. And I think they have campgrounds that have facilities, but the one I was at doesn't have any, like, water or anything, which is fine. That's how I, I, I don't mind rolling like that anyway. 
but I wake up in the morning, I get out of my tent and there's like cattle grazing around me and shit, you know, mm-hmm. like, but it's, um, yeah, it's just land you can go camp on for free or sometimes it's like five bucks if you use like an established like camping area that'll have like a fire yeah. ring. But it's, yeah. no one ever goes out there. No one uses it, you know? That's one of those like things yeah, that in the US I, that nobody I, I, gets a... I love it, dude. It's beautiful. I, I, I love it. I love this. I, I love the, oh, the this vast open center of America where you can, like, I really like Colorado. I can't be thinking about moving to Denver because I love the fact that you've got a city there, but then like you can just go in the mountains and just have these trails with nobody on them. Mm-hmm. you know it's just uh, i just just absolute beautiful country and then yeah like i said uh, arizona utah i just utah just blows my mind when you're just driving for utah that, it's that sunrise place is, and it's sunset incredible places. oh man <laughs> how it changes yeah. colors at sunrise and sunset it's just like oh my god i know what you're saying man i spent i me and um, andrew tomorrow uh our buddy cson and flores we did a um zion national park we did the, mm. it was like trans zion hike so it's like 45 miles and uh Dude, just great. No one's out there. You're in the middle of the wilderness, and it's just all this crazy stuff that nobody ever sees. It's yeah. it's amazing. Even around, Utah's amazing. Even around Vegas, bro. Like just like literally fucking thirty minutes around Vegas, you've got these incredible, incredible amount. Like one of my favorite things mm-hmm. from Vegas, dude, is like um, obviously coming in at sunrise, and yeah. then again coming on sunrise, looking at your balcony, and again like you're saying about changing colors. When the sun hits those rocks, those red rocks, yeah, it just looks insane, man. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so driving across America, I like to see like America to me shouldn't be one country. It's like it's kind of like a mistake that America is one country. <laughs> it's like it doesn't even make sense that it's yeah. one country because it's so many different. That's so what I told. Different. I was ta- so my cousin. I interviewed my cousin, and she was on yesterday. I think is when it released, and she she lives in Italy. And I was talking mm-hmm. about. I think we. Were, I think that's when we were talking about how. The U.S. is so big; it should. It's like Europe, you know. The diversity is like yeah. Europe, like, and we expect it to all everyone to function under one umbrella and be the same. And it's like that's not the way; it can never work that way. Just because just there's so, ma- there's just so many different people in so many different areas. That's why the way the federal government is supposed to work, it's supposed to be more hands off, and it's supposed to be states' government coming in and run it, and then the federal backs mm-hmm. them up as required. And we've just kind of lost sight of that, and we're putting all the power especially all the power into one person on the president. Some people like that yeah. when they're pre- dudes in and then they hate it when they're next dudes in, you know, <laughs> which, so. which always happens. It will always go back and forth as a swing thing. So, but yeah. like, yeah, I do, I think it's, I think it's nuts. Like the state system makes sense to me, you know? Um, but of course, in an area, the size of America, of course, you're going to have different issues in one part to another. Like, of course you yeah. are. That just seems so fucking obvious. And, um, it just, it doesn't, well, it doesn't work if you've got people in, um, if, if you've got people in, I, well, we're both in California right now, yeah. the needs of people and the wants of people in California are going to be different to the needs and wants of people in Colorado. Um, Dude, I'm, I'm, even in California, it's so separate. The people in yeah. California is run by people that uh, the vast majority of people in California live in the cities on the coastline, but there's a ton of people that are inland California that disagree with all California politics. They hate the taxes. It's screwing like What's the farmers Jeff, and stuff Jefferson, like that. Is it Jefferson County or something? That thing. They're trying to What's make that, it into a, a separate a, state. Yeah. Yeah. Up, up, in, up in Northern California. But when I went Jefferson. to North, Yeah. When I went up to, um, when I went to, um, yes, yeah, state, sorry, not County. When I went up to um, Northern California, I was like, fuck, this is a different state. Yeah. This is nothing. Dude, Orange County is a different fucking beast to LA. Yeah, San Diego is a ve- San Diego is a very different beast to LA, you know. And then if you go to fucking um, the in, you know, if you go inland, the fucking Riverside, Corona, these places, they're fucking very different to, you know, to LA. Like, like mm-hmm. a- California has a bunch of these microcosms within it. Yeah. Um, and then um, you know, and then America itself just has them. And I just think it just seems so obvious that how you're going to have like this two party system that's going to that's going to cater for the needs of nearly half a billion people. It's, it's nuts. Yeah. It's fun times. <laughs> We're figuring it out. It's just, all know? right. This is a question I ask everyone, dude. I don't want to be all Mr. Doom and Gloom, but I do think this is an interesting one. Um, cause I, I think one of the things, obviously you and I are both military people. I so, suppose most of your listeners are too. Um, America has, is, you know, like, fuck we I'm 36 years old now. So pretty much all my adult life, America and, you know, to UK to some degree has been at war, right? And I feel like one of the things that does keep America focused and as a group is the fact that there's always an enemy. 
because there's not really that many points in history where America hasn't had an external enemy, even if it's the Cold War and it wasn't a direct confrontation. I mean, it was essentially, you know, Russians were the enemy. People were worried about Russian spies. And I think without that external enemy, I think America would start to implode a little bit um, and turn in on itself because there's, you know, there's not that external force for everyone to join it, to join in and agree that this is the bad guy. What do you think about that? Um, I think, okay, so let me, let me think how I want to put it. The U S is, I don't think, I, I don't like that people, when they say we've always been at war, there have been like small conflicts, but to say that's like at war is kind of a misnomer. There are things that go on. I think people in the U S thrive on being like known as like the world's police and like, Hey, we're, you know, being the beacon of hope or whatever you want to say, you know, cause a lot of immigrants do look at the U S as like, that's the, that's what we should strive to be. Um, mm -hmm. and I like, uh, I was talking to somebody about it the other day. There's a Asian, I think it's Asian destroys America, the stand up comedy on Netflix. There's this, uh, Chinese dude. And he's like, you guys don't know it. He's like, you're the NBA. He's like, everyone outside, outside of the U S looks at you. <laughs> like you're the NBA. You guys have everything. You have excess of everything. And I think, I think the U S does take pride in being like, Hey, we, you know, we hold a higher standard that you know, we try to hold people to a higher standard, but at the same time, I think we've gotten, I think the world as a whole has just gotten so weird and technologies. We've opened up so much information to people to learn things and understand why countries are doing things or why things are happening, but no one does it. It's mm -hmm. like, if I, if when I was younger, if I had all the information I have from my phone, you know, like I, all this information in my hand and, and people just don't use it. And no, you would have been, you would have been looking at porn. If you were younger and you had that phone, you would have just been looking at porn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. But I mean, I remember being a kid and looking stuff up in encyclopedias and stuff, but yeah, no, same. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I don't think we necessarily need an enemy, but I do think that people in the U S would prefer us. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of those like, Hey, shape your own destiny kind of things. Like, yeah. would I prefer China to shape foreign policy or, you know, help meld foreign policy and, and nations that are up and coming or something like that. No, because look at how they're, look at how they treat, look at, I mean, fuck man, everything we're doing right now is because of China, you know, and people are looking at them like, look at how they stopped the coronavirus in their country. It's like, yeah, because they like killed people and like imprisoned people. And you know, like that's how they do it. That's yeah. how. And so to say, I would let, I would like the U S to step back and let someone like that step in. Yeah. Nah, I think, and I think that's it. I don't think we necessarily need an enemy, but um, well, I, I just think I that know. in general, like it's like when you're in boot camp, you all bond over the fact that your drill instructor is the quote unquote enemy. So I think having someone that like is a is, is something that you can kind of agree upon and be like, yeah, this this is bad. Like it's like a common ground. I think I think is is helpful with the whole China, the, the whole fucking China thing. I think like that's what people aren't. Like, that's what worries me about the situation we're in now. It's like, because, like, China's, like, an extreme example of, like, how state control can be very fucking bad for people. Yeah. And we're nowhere, we're nowhere near that. And I'm no. not saying that. But I'm saying to people, if you continue to give up powers and things, this is where you can end up. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is where you can end up. It's, And I think one thing that, like, um, I find um, that you get in the West I think especially with people that haven't really traveled much and have had their exposure to. So like in the military, you know, some people choose to use the opportunity, some don't. But you can, and private security too, you get exposure to like a lot of different countries, a lot of different cultures. Mm -hmm. And you realize that fundamentally people are the same. Like we might have some differences. You know, you might worship a different God or you might, you know, you might have a different idea about what marriage is. But essentially, you want the same thing. You want your family to be prosperous. You know, you want to, your kids to grow up in safety and all this kind of stuff. Right? Yeah. But I think with people that haven't traveled and stuff, they don't see that. So they have this thing of, oh, well, that would only happen in Russia. Oh, well, that would only happen in China. Forgetting that each of these countries are made up of people. Like, so there might be some cultural differences, and those mm -hmm. can be significant. But it's still, you're dealing with the raw material of people. So if it can happen in one place, it can happen in another and there's a lot of fucking nasty shit that's gone on in America and Britain. You know, Britain, when we had an empire, did some fucking horrible shit to people. So, yeah. but I think yeah. we have like... A, but that but was, you know, people... So on that real quick, though, is people hate on the 
on Britain for like world conquering and all that stuff. Spain, France, like they all took everyone part in it. Up. You know, everyone kind of took their jabs at it, but there were at some point, you know, China with Genghis Khan. Or was it China? Yeah, I would say China probably. Right? Yeah, Mon- 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 Mongolia. Mongolia. Okay, excuse me. See, I don't even know my history, but you uh, know, th- this during during those time frames is that's kind of, that was the norm. So to look back from 2020, like in 2020, yeah, that's the things that happened were completely horrible. They were completely horrible then, but they were also the norm then. And and yeah, I'm not was, justifying was, I'm not justifying yeah. any of the crazy shit that countries did yeah. to like take over areas, but to say that we or we uh, to say that a a nation moved in like say like Columbus coming here to the U.S. and stuff like that and yeah. or coming to wherever he landed whoever it, it, wherever it is now we don't know. Um, to say that him fighting the people there, like they, like those were just perfectly peaceful people that never fought anybody. You know, these yeah. were also Aztec people or people in South America or not South America, but man, I, I'm making myself look like a real ass right now. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop. I'm just <laughs> no, saying, I, I, I'm just I, I, saying I there's atrocities points. everywhere. And we like to only point out yeah. one thing about one yeah. area. I think, but I think that's the point. That's, that's exactly the point that we need to be aware of mm-hmm. is that people fundamentally everywhere, every time in history, have coveted power and will use violence to attain it. Yeah. And and when I say I don't like China dictating foreign policy, it's the government. It's not necessarily the people. The people are good people. They go to work. They do what they have to do. Their government tells them this and they don't know anybody. That's where they were. They were, you know, they were further from there. They were born there. They were raised there. Yeah. And it's almost like roulette as well, bro, because it's like, you know, there's a lot of like circumstance that goes into like who's going to, who, who happens to hit power at the right moment and things like there's like, there's a chance with, you know, with, if you look at fucking Hitler, right. If there's a bullet had gone to the inch or left or right, we never would have had him. And you might have had some, some uh, other politician who was just as charismatic, charismatic come in who led the country in another direction. And yeah. I think my, my, my issue with all these kind of like these powers and those restrictions we see now is doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything going on now that's going to be that bad for anyone it's just if you happen to get the wrong character in at the wrong time and then um Mm -hmm. you know quite often it's on the back of then you have a an economic crash and then on top of the economic crash you have a hurricane katrina at the same time all these things combine and then that's when it becomes a a problem you know i think um i think it takes a lot of bad shit to happen at the same time to really make stuff you know you know fall down um as massively as we saw in like world war ii things but the problem now is that the problem, the problem where we're at now is like, you know, my grand, my, my, both my grandfathers who are World War II veterans have passed away now. There's very few World War II veterans around now. Mm-hmm. When my pet, when my mum was growing up, it was like well, my mum was born in, you know, late, like late in the late fifties. You know, she was growing up where, like for for us with nine eleven, nine eleven is twenty years ago nearly, right? Yeah, we're the so, same age, so yeah. And it, it feels like nothing, does it? It feels like nothing. So for my mum growing up it felt like World War II was nothing away. And so people knew that fucking these cataclysmic things can happen in the blink of a fucking night. Like, I asked my grandma about it. I was like, did you like, did you guys see it coming? She was like, no, we didn't think it was going to happen all the way up to it. We mm-hmm. were just thinking like, it'll work out, it'll work out, it'll work out. And now because like the, our younger generations, you know, um, people our age and younger we just haven't ever seen anything like that. So even this COVID, which obviously it's tragic, it's fucking tragic for anyone that's lost anybody, anyone that's even been sick, it's it's tragic. But let's be honest, in the scale of fucking world disasters over the last few hundred years, it's fucking nothing. You know, it's nothing compared to a lot of things in the last hundred years. Now, and like, but to us, because this is the biggest thing, it seems huge. And I, I just don't think that people understand that like, yes, this is, like I said, it is tragic. It does have the potential yeah. to be worse than it is. But that doesn't mean that you can go throwing away, like, in panic, that you go throwing away the things that could set you up for a, for an even bigger disaster. Like, I don't think people are looking at, like, the secondary, tertiary kind of effects of decisions that are being made right now. I know what you're saying. Um, but I think also that if they – if if some of the measures aren't being taken, like if we just let it ride, they, they were saying up to 2 million people could die from it. You know, re- whereas now because of, you know, some of the things they've instituted that we're now closer, possibly around 200,000. Now they haven't given a time frame or anything like that. And I think they said the models for that go out till August. So that doesn't count in like next year and when it comes yeah. back and stuff. But 
I know what I you're saying. I, I I know what you're saying, and and I'm all about like, yeah, I think there's definitely an overreach of government in almost any case. And and the thing that gets me is that people see how bad the government fucks stuff up, but they still want to like add more government. Like, hey, let's like yeah. let's throw more money at this problem. Like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, we they don't work. Like, it just doesn't work. Like, stop putting money. You know, they're wasting our money, especially out here in California, man. Yeah. It, well, dude, one of the funniest ones is for me has been the stimulus, the stimulus package. Oh, it's yeah. like people are getting so happy about it. It's like, yeah, but how much did you, um, dude? Like my fucking like I. So I in this in the UK, I pay forty percent on my income. Um, I probably pay forty percent on my income. Is that the average? Uh, like, what's the no, no, what's the, like the, the scale average, go? So you do you do twenty? Like it's usually about twenty five. It's about twenty five percent, and then once you earn over a certain amount, then you pay forty percent on that. Okay. Um. So it, essentially. I would say so. It probably averages out that at least a third of my income goes to tax, income tax, and I don't really get anything back from that. I don't have kids, so I don't get any credit on kids or or any of that kind of stuff. The what do, you area, mean, do they give you money back if you have kids? You can get you can get credit for kids, and like you can get like there's some like you can, there's like kickbacks for being married and having kids and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but I don't have that stuff, and my kids aren't going to school, so I'm not you know benefiting from my, any of that and. Um, you know, and one of the things I've, I've been thinking about with it, cause I just, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in like, I, I don't have a problem with paying some tax, but I think that the amount, the reason I have a problem with it is because there's kids that I went to school with. I say kids, they're my age now who have never worked a day in their life because they just made the decision they weren't going to work and they've been, they've received an yeah. income entire life. Yeah. Um, so that's why I have an issue with it. I have no problem whatsoever with contributing to help families who have sick kids that don't like i don't have any fucking problem with that whatsoever of course not um i like the fact that the uk has the you know the health system that it does and i'm happy to pay into that but like you say you see so much fucking money wasted um you know that's kind of like that that's kind of my issue with it and i also think as well it's like if if it's if it's like hey if you're going to take 40 percent of my income then how about you fucking trust me as an adult to make the right decision about going outside and that kind of thing. You know, it's like, let's have a, let's have a bit of given, let's have a bit of give and take here. That sucks that you guys have to pay 40%, man. I mean, that's, I mean, what are you going to do? What do you think? How, how do you feel about the healthcare there compared to here? I, and here's, here's what I'm going to say real quick about healthcare stuff is that I think if anything, this pandemic has proven that no healthcare system in the world is ready for something like this. doesn't matter if it was something that's more socialized or something that's more like, you know, I don't know what you want to call ours more, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, commercial, private sector. Private yeah, sector. private, private sector. Um, I feels like everyone was <laughs> oh, screwed because it's capacity. Don't you know? me. Yeah. yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. Um, no, you're right, dude. And here's the thing with the, cause the problem with the NHS, and again, this is like a, some an issue I have with government full stop, is that a lot of the NHS is taken up by managerial levels. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the money goes. They've had every time there's a socialist government in the UK, um, they and they want to increase jobs. What's the easiest way of saying that you increase jobs? More government jobs. So they put more more layers of bureaucracy in. Yeah. So like this bloated middle of the NHS, um, that's where like a lot of the money could like. Could be, could be saved is by gutting those jobs but of course those are the jobs they protect because nobody wants to be the one that, you know then then if you cut those jobs you're portrayed as attacking the nhs where actually what you're trying to do is cut the glut in the middle um and Maybe. so the money actually gets to patients yeah clean up um, the process yeah exactly so like that's that's a bit that's a big problem about it dude but the other thing as well is like here's my thing with the nhs I see a lot of people saying Stay at home, you know, don't overburden the NHS. I'm thinking, don't overburden the NHS. You're fucking fat. You never you never fucking exercise. You drink, you smoke. But now that it suits you, because you get to sit on your ass and stay at home, then now it's don't overburden the NHS. So my issue with this whole thing of, like, say, finding people for going outside during this whole pandemic is are we going to, like, by extension – that would make sense to me that if you're going to do that, are you going to start finding people for not exercising? Are you going to start finding people for drinking? Are you going to start finding yeah. people for dry? Like, are you going to start people for taking unnecessary? Because every unnecessary journey in your car contributes to emissions. Yeah, you know, like where where does it where does it stop? Like, because I I'm if you want to be if you want to fucking eat McDonald's every day and drink. You have the right to do that, in my opinion. I think you're fucking stupid, but you've got the right to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, but I just find it very, very strange 
the that stuff's all just like that stuff's like oh let it ride let it ride that but yeah, like, I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're, that's like been one of my kind of my arguments about it too. Like, if you're dictating, if I'm, if you're making me pay for other people's health care, then I should have a say in how they're living their life. You know, that, I mean, and that's, and I don't really believe that it should be like that. So that's not, that's like, but what you're getting at, you know, what you're saying is who draws the line? You know, exactly. who who's the one that draws the line, and why are they the right person to draw the line? You mm-hmm. know, and and then. Ah, yeah, it's a slippery slope, man. It's one of those things where, well, we're just only going to regulate this. And then and it becomes, oh, well, you know, car accidents kill a lot of yeah. people. So now we're going to do more regulation on this. And it's well, just bro, one of those things. I remember driving in Texas a couple of years ago, it was 2017, and there was a sign on the road saying, road deaths in Texas this year, 37,000. Oh, so really? There's, <laughs> Jesus. There's, yeah, and so I looked it up. And there was there was over 37,000 road deaths in Texas in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we take everyone's cows away in Texas? You know, people people hate on the U.S. and they say that the U.S. Uh, the U.S. healthcare system is fucked up because our um, average lifespan is like we're like what number three or number five or something like that. Like we're not number one, so obviously we suck. Um, but then when you actually take out car accidents, when you take out car accidents or like murder, we're number one, mm. which means that the general healthcare is better than not yeah. i mean i won't say that but it's like we're not as bad as people i just hate statistics because people fuck it up and you saying thirty seven thousand people died in texas like that's crazy yeah and that's one year but like that <laughs> but again this is the thing what are you going to do if you because if, if you if you'd have banned cars in texas if you would not let anyone have a car in texas those thirty seven thousand people would be alive yeah. so what should we do should, what, so what should we do take all the cars away yeah yeah, it's again. It's one of those things. It's like it's a fine line because at what point does my right to do what I want? Because car accidents, a lot of times, especially out here in California, you see people street race and stuff like that, and they'll hit like a pedestrian or they'll hit a car, yep. another car. Because you got these assholes, and don't get me wrong, I used to I used to run up and down the five in my Evo, you know, with other guys. But I won't I wouldn't do it. I would do it when there's like a gap in cars and we could run together. And yeah. some of these dudes come out here and just weave in and out of cars and shit like that. And it's just a danger to public. So, but you're right. Like, are we just going to stop everybody from driving? Cause there's a couple assholes that are on the road. Yeah, and- exactly. But again, that's common sense. Like, cause there's a big difference. Cause look, sometimes there'll be an accident. Like you'll be driving, you'll be doing everything properly and a deer will run out in front of you and you'll have an accident. Yeah. There's, or you might hit, there might be some oil on the road. You hit some oil. It wasn't your fault. There will be accidents. Yeah. And then, the, and then there's, dickheads who are fucking street racing like they're, they're, <laughs> anyone with a fucking ounce of common sense can see how those two things differ yeah uh, so it's the same with this situation we're in now there's a big difference between having 20 friends over for a fucking party and going for a walk on the beach to get some exercise for sure yeah. those two things are so fucking different a lot uh, of doctors are telling people they need to get outside occasionally like get outside and i mean i have my dog so i'm you know he goes out a couple times a day so i'm out walking the block and stuff like that so or I, I was taking him to Balboa Park down here in San Diego, but the park's that's closed. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. That's a nice park. Yeah, but that, I was up. That, I was on a big ass lawn by myself. And, and huge. The beaches, and the and beaches. They kicked too. me out. They closed your beaches too, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's what I like. I, I'm in San Clemente right now, and the beaches are open, which I fucking like because my friends are saying to me like, "How are you on there? How are you not getting fucking arrested?" I'm like, "Well, the cops are down there. They just they're just being real." Like, uh, so shout out to the fucking sheriff's office around here because they're just being. Well, just you're in being, Orange County, so it's a yeah. little. It's they're being, they're, they're just being, um, what's, what's the word? Just more being common like, sense. Just, yeah, they're just applying common sense. In Encinitas, yesterday I saw a news headline in Encinitas, California, um, which is North County, it's just south of Camp Pendleton, north of San Diego. Uh, cops ticketed 22 people with thousand dollar citations for for being on the beach watching the sunset yesterday. Oh my god! <laughs> well, hey, you you That's can't tell crazy, me, you can't man. tell me you can't tell me as well that they're not seeing this as a great opportunity to bring in some cash. I mean, I don't, I, I hate that, that I would hate to think that that's what they're doing it for. I know they're trying to, I, I, I want to believe that for sure that they're doing it for public safety, but I think, I think the correct thing would be, Hey, come down there and be like, get out of here. Or I'm going to give you a ticket. Mm -hmm. Not like, all right, everyone, or chase a dude down on a paddleboard with two fucking boats to get, make sure you can, you know, handcuff them. Like, get the fuck out of here. That's excessive. Like that's common sense has to apply. Yeah. Um, And again, I have no problem with. Um, if they think that there's a group of people on the beach, I have no problem with them asking people to disperse. Yeah. It's, but then fucking fines and citations. 
It's like these people are already struggling with fucking finances as it is, and then you got to come in and do that on top of it. Yeah. Like, I, I, I think there's going to be the repercussions from this lockdown and stuff. I think there's going to be, um, and you're probably not going to fucking hear anything about it, but there's bound to be a cry, there's bound to be surges in fucking crime. There's bound to be mm. surges in bankruptcy. There's bound oh, to be yeah, surges sure. in people losing their job. There's so, so many negative effects. Um, I think it's something like just under a thousand people a week commit suicide in America as it is. That's surely going to fucking increase. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. And it's like, like as far as like, you'll see your that, stand, you'll like, see your standard increase in everything that you yeah. see when like the great re- when the recession happened or when the depression happened. The good thing here is like, unlike the depression or unlike when like the Spanish flu came through, because that's what everybody keeps comparing this back to the Spanish flu. We have technology, so you and I are talking to each other, but you're yeah. you know you're seventy miles away north of me, and but but we can still talk, and that was part yeah. of the reason why during the Spanish flu period that it came back and so many people got sick is because people were like fuck this, I'm not staying inside anymore. Like yeah. you know they have to think about that. You know that was a time where there was no technology. Your entertainment came from books and like records and shit. You know like mm-hmm. so we're lucky that we're going through it now. It's tough. It's tough. It's definitely tough for some people. Um, I think it's easier for military people, especially if you've done any kind of like yeah, 100%. <laughs> deployment or like being on ship for sure. Like you're used to being, you know, locked away and secluded yeah. from society. Um, and I did when, when I was on those ships too, I don't know about you, but we didn't like, we had a basic, you could use the ship's email system, um, but only when they weren't using it. So really you might get one or two emails a day, but you couldn't, there was no phones. There was no internet. Yeah. So, like, so it was, it was cut off, cut off. You know? on, the, on the U S ships, there's um, what they do is they throttle the internet, like their satellite internet. And there's only, only so much bandwidth. So oh. <laughs> like everything else, they do it by rank. You know, like if you're the lowest rank, you can get on from this time to this time. And your internet speed is like, like it's like zero, 400. It's like, zero, four, dude, ten. it's like you pick up, like you click on a photo and you sit there and watch it. Like, you know, load the screen as the photo <laughs> starting to load. It's like old school internet, like dial up. Yeah. Um, and it just cuts off just before, just before the vagina is fully. <laughs> fully oh, you can't do that. Nah, it's different. Oh, really? it's, no way, dude. Not on a government ship. You'll get, they'll charge you for it. God, You'll hundred yeah. percent get charged. You guys can drink on your ships, right? On the Navy, on Did the it? Royal Navy ships. I don't know. I never went on one. No. All right, so we're like way into this. And we haven't even talked about you at all, like like who you are and what you do. I'm so, just I'm just doing my three percent of fucking stuff, bro. So your uh, so your um, your grandparents were both in World War Two. World War Two, I think, was very more impactful for the UK. One, it's smaller, so and you and like you were on the front lines. Like the country as a whole was on it the was front a, lines. It was a front line. Yeah, it was, it was like, like bombing. It was, it was a very real chance that it was a very real chance that Hitler was going to invade um, in ninety five. If they'd have won, if they'd have won air superiority during the Battle of Britain, they would have invaded Britain. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And um, I think. And, I think, I've got bomb craters by my house back home. Like, oh, really? Like where? Yeah, where I go walking, you see, like you know, like a st- well, of course you do. But so people like listen to like a stick of bombs. You know, when the bombs fall, you know they they they'll fall, and then you have you'll you'll basically get like a line of craters. Yeah. Um, so like my you know the footpaths and stuff that I use back home, I go past lines of craters. Um, you know, half my house um, was the one of the walls is a different uh, one of the walls is a different brick because the. Um, because a, a, a concussion wave took out uh, took out one of the walls of the house. Really, you know, yeah. So it was um, there. There's um, you know, there's there's bombers. There's bits of wreckage of bombers and stuff like that around where I live. You know, it's it was it was the front line. Yeah, you know, and, and um, you know, my you know my grandparents. Um, one of my one of my grandparents, he was a, but both of them were in the RAF. One of them was a fitter. Uh, mm-hmm. The other one was a navigator on the uh, on the Lancaster bombers. You know where they had like they had the seventy five percent casualty rate. Yeah, that's a um, that's a rough job to but, be in. Yeah, but he came. You know, he came through it. He did a full tour with did a full tour with them. He got shot down. He had um, only guy in his crew to survive. Damn. Uh, he had uh, and he was popping. He was popping shrapnel out of his body until the day that he died. And um, yeah, then he took a commission in the army. He went out to he went out to to India and. I'm always like, you know, people talk about the nuclear bombs and stuff. I always think like, well, yeah, I, I don't feel like if it, was, if it wasn't for those, I wouldn't be here because he, him and hundreds of thousands of other soldiers would have probably died in Japan. So, yeah, um, yeah, that was kind of his, their service. 
that's weird when you look at the uh, yeah when you really think about the second and third order effects of that. But on the on the other side, they people in Japan are saying the same thing about their own people. However, they did start the war on that front. Yeah. So, so it sucks that it sucks that it had to happen. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's one easy. of the like the greatest human tragedies. However, for sure, you you really can't see what was the alternative. It's easy to look back and judge the decision, but it was I can't imagine having to have made that decision. You know, I think it was the right call, bro. I think it was the I think it was absolutely. I don't think there should be any um, regret. Now you can have you can have you can have a huge amount of sadness that it came to that, which we should we should have because mm-hmm. most of those people were probably just good normal people. So we should be sad about it. But we shouldn't regret it because one way or another, there was going to be a butcher's bill. Yeah, uh, I've and always people, and, and those people were just, people were going to suffer there either way. Unfortunately, they've been led to that position. They were going to suffer either way. I've always kind of regretted, or I, I mean, regretted not getting sent to Japan ever, like even for mm. training or anything like that, because I wanted to like visit some of these you know famous battlefields and like places. Like I'm all about history, and you know, some people go to Japan and just drink drink their you know, three years or two years there away and then never go see any of the cultural stuff. But I think that's something that if you're there, like if you're there in the military and you're listening to this or any other country, like take advantage of where you're at. Like yeah, people would pay, p- people would pay. So, and take pictures, you know, like take pictures. Cause that's, I think a lot of people get out and regret. They go back and they're like, man, I really wish I would have taken more pictures of the shit I did. Yeah. Um, so was your parents, well, first off was world war one and world war one and world war two. Like when you guys do you, I think you, we call it Memorial day. Um, when you guys celebrate every year or remember every year, I don't want to say celebrate. Um, I feel like it's way more serious in the UK than it is in the U S like it's, it, it, it and, is. And, and part of part of my problem with it in the U S is that you get all these veterans that come out and become douchebags on days like that for whatever reason, you know? And it's I, a very I, different, very different for us, man. Yeah. So here's the thing, right? So in like, well, one in the UK, we're a smaller country, right? Yeah. So we're a very condensed country and we're very much centered around rather than cities where most of the country is centered around villages, mm-hmm. right? Every village has got a memorial with hundreds of names on it of guys from that village that died in world war one and world war two. You could go through a tiny fucking village in the middle of nowhere and there's going to be a war memorial with dozens of names on it from the guys mm-hmm. that died from that village. So it's very much like burned into the psyche of the country, the amount of like the amount and the percentage of the, guy, the guys that died. And because we are more village centric than America is, it's just something that you've just seen all your life. And if you're in the military or if you're interested in it, you've seen these names because you, like, you know, a war memorial is something you pay attention to. So you've seen these names all your life and how many are on there. And, um, and also when it comes to the whole douchebag thing, like, don't get me wrong. There's some douchebags in the UK in the military who try and do the same thing, but we've never been we're, and we're still not, we're not, pla- we're not placed on a pedestal like American servicemen are. Yeah. It's, like the thing when like I don't I think times might be changing and this you might be getting more stuff, but I used to joke with people that the best the best discount or or freebie or anything like that used to get when I was in the army was fifty percent off Domino's on a Wednesday, <laughs> or something. That was the best thing. The idea of going to college and get I tried to get a kettlebell course paid for while I was a physical training instructor. Yeah. It was eighty bucks and we wouldn't cover it. So, so what, I, what are, do you guys have like a, so we have the GI bill here, the post nine, we're on the we, post nine 11 GI bill. Do you guys have a college education fund like that? No. <laughs> the military doesn't get free education or anything when you get out? No, do they fuck? You can get, if you've done a certain amount of time, you can get something that's equivalent to like an MVQ, but it's not even a, it's not even like a lower, like it's, it's fucking like, it's the, you, you might be able to get retrained as like a plumber or something like that, but you're not getting a college education. Oh, really? So they're yeah. just like, well, you did the military, so that's, yeah. this they, is your they fight might, now. Like what most what most people use it for is to do a close protection course. Really? Like that's that that's been the standard for guys. They use it to do a close protection course, um, and because you get a certain amount of like enhanced learning credits, and you can put those to do it to do it in it. Um, but that's that's the equivalent of what it's getting you is a close protection course. Mm-hmm. It's not getting you. Um, it's not getting you even like a, the most basic community college degree. That's that's pretty wild. I think I think you're right that the U.S. we we do put our veterans up on a pedestal, and sometimes rightfully so, and sometimes. So I think it's a direct um, 
reflection or direct like it's directly because of Vietnam and how people were treated after Vietnam and stuff like that. And then when I remember being young and when my dad came back from the Gulf War, it was just like parades and, you know, like when they came home, there's just videos of them, you know, driving under the overpasses and everybody's got signs and stuff like that. And, you know, every, it's like people after the Gulf War wanted to make it a point to be like, you know, welcome home because a lot of people knew they fucked up after the Vietnam War. Yeah. And that sentiment has kind of carried over. Um, it's kind of died off now, but at the same time, I, most veterans that I know don't want like recognition. It's like, I don't want, like I was talking to my buddy, Andrew, uh, I was out talking to Andrew and, and Joel. Um, and we were talking about discounts. I've never asked for a discount at like a restaurant. Even while I was in, I'm like, you mm. know, if I go up to a ticket counter to go to a museum and it's like, Hey, veterans, 10 bucks. I'm like, Hey, let me get that. But I don't go, if it's like yeah. right there, I don't go out of my way to ask for it because I feel like it, I feel to me, it feels yeah, like a douchebag move. Dirty. I know people say you, dirty. <laughs> the only, and really the only thing I use now for like free discounts or anything is, um, my national park pass. You get a yeah, free national yeah. park pass. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I was like, fuck yeah, I'm going to definitely going to take advantage yeah. of that. So but dude, I think one thing to take into account as well is, um, nine 11 and the G watt. Um, it all kind of corresponds with, um, 24 hour, uh, 24 hour channels, um, more content, social media mm -hmm. and veterans and the military make for great content. Oh, so yeah. I, I think that's been a part of it as well, because it's been like, who doesn't want that content of seeing the soldier coming home and hugging his kids? So I think that's been a part of it as well. I think definitely you're right about the, the, the Vietnam kind of like the counterbalance yeah. That's or, or kind of like overreaction. That's been a part of it. But I think it's just the fact that there's just been more avenues for showing this stuff, for putting it out there. Mm -hmm. And then companies have realized it's great PR to, 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 or we do this for a veteran or we'll do a free dinner. Like, you know, they realize and everyone's kind of jumped on that. Like the NFL, uh, they didn't used to do uh, until I think it was after 9 11, they didn't used to do like the, the flag and have all the soldiers on the field and everything like that. But then they jump, you know, they go, they get involved in it, and it's well, then, just, but they actually found out that the Department of Defense was paying for that. Like the NFL was making the Department of Defense pay for that as a, yeah, as advertising rather than yeah. just like, hey, bring these guys out because we like them, you know, which yeah. is fucked up. So, but yeah, but like that's, but, but I know like, what you're saying. Yeah, but like, so I think, um, you know, that's kind of become a big part of it is because people have seen more people have seen more of it on TV, and like a lot of the TV shows as well are very fucking sappy about oh you know they try and make us all out to be fucking like dude i fucking love being on operations i love being in contact like i keep saying right if if i could go back to a contact right now i'd love to be in one but only if it was from a fighting position because i've not got the cardio to be running <laughs> around. but yeah, if, right. you, if you could drop me right now if you could drop me right now behind some fucking sandbags in a fucking contact i would fucking bite your arm off and as would most veterans most veterans would love to get back in there putting rounds down and like, but the way that with the way that we've been portrayed is like, oh, poor Tommy needs a hug. Oh, give him a cuddle. He's got it's like, fuck you, man. Fucking bunch of warriors. Don't need your fucking pity. Well, it's the it's the feed off it. it's the veterans that like feed off that as well too, though the ones that take advantage of it. They're like, oh, I committed this crime because my PTSD. Oh, I'm doing this. I'm homeless because I'm a veteran. It's like, dude. The last person that should be homeless in the yeah. U.S. is a veteran. There are so many freaking Bro. things out there for veterans. To to the VA yeah. has a homeless hotline. There's programs in like every state for veterans. There's not even that, but social groups like con like reach out to someone. You know, like I don't know. Dude, man. I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna say something. That like, look, every fucking suicide in the veteran is a fucking tragedy, right? And I'm not taking away from that. However, whenever a veteran commits suicide, people are like, oh, it's fucking PTSD. Well, a lot of these veterans who commit suicide never even been in fucking combat. One, yeah. and if and if you scratch below the surface, quite often it's a fucking girl that's the reason. Like yeah. the same reason that a lot of the same reason that a lot of men fucking commit suicide: debt and women. Yeah, we're like, like that. But we are, we are fucking stupid, dude. And like, because I, I, I had an honest look back at like my worst times, and I was like, right, was this PTSD or was this woman and debt and stuff? And I'm like, you know what? It's mostly women and debt. Like yeah. the PTSD didn't help, but that wasn't the main thing. Yeah, that it, was just like, like it was the other stuff, and then that didn't help. But we're assuming like, we that need it, to be we're, fucking honest, bro. 
Yeah, we're assuming that if like these people weren't in the military, they wouldn't have committed suicide. Which I think some people, exactly. it's just in their brain. It's just programmed in their brain. And this is this is coming from a guy who's had family members, multiple family members, commit suicide. People commit suicide on deployment. Like my last deployment, a kid um, killed himself on our ship and stuff. You know, uh, my my roommate that I had when I was in Iraq um, killed himself like two years ago, um, and. I don't, I mean, and I don't know, obviously I don't know all their individual circumstances, but it's, it's a mental health thing. And it's not, mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, dude, what can you do about it? You know what I'm saying? Well, like when the, someone's the ready to the end the game, when someone's ready to be done, it's like, how can you, yeah. you got to show them, you got to show them that there's people there that love them and that there's more to do because you know, there is, but at the same time, it's like, it's ultimately going to be their decision. And it's 2020. If you want to do something stupid like that, then, yeah. you know. Well, here's the thing, bro. Like, we look at mental health and we assume that we can fix it all. Now, some people get cancer to the point where we go, well, we can't beat it now. It's cancer. It's going to win. It's going to kill them. With mental health, for some reason, we have this fucking feeling that we can always win. That, like, if someone does commit suicide, it's like, oh, we missed something. Some people, I think it's just like fucking cancer. Some people are just, uh, unfortunately, are just not in a position where they can be helped. Well, the now, bad thing it doesn't is, mean, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But yeah. at the same time, at the same time, we need to fucking be realistic about this. If someone like this, sometimes you, we can't win every fucking battle. Unfortunately, as much as that sucks. Yeah, I mean, it's um, I don't know, suicide, man. It's it's just one of those things. It's. I don't get it. I mean, I would get it, I guess, if you're like 90 and you're in like super ill health and you just like, hey, man, there's nothing. I'm just waiting to die at this point. That's yeah. a completely different situation, but younger people. Um, so I can speak to it because I've actually been in the position where I, where I, where I was like that. Okay. Um, and it was, um, yeah, like, and it, um, it was probably, well, we talk, probably the worst of it was probably about five years ago now. No, about four years ago. And it wasn't the, it it wasn't that I wanted to die, but I just didn't want to go on living as I was, and I couldn't see a way out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, but it was more so. My my kind of theory behind this is that, like, as a soldier or as a marine, there's a part of you that's okay with sacrificing um, yourself for other people, right? In fact, you actually kind of like we've all had those thoughts of like, oh yeah, fuck, jump on the grenade for my boys and get the Medal of Honor or Victoria Cross, you know? Like yeah. that's kind of who that's kind of who we are, right? And you're okay with the fact about dying for your boys. So one of the things I think about PTSD and suicide is you are aware that you're not functioning properly. You are aware that you're becoming and you feel like a burden. So you're feeling like, fuck, I feel so sorry for everyone that's around me because I keep snapping. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fun to be around. I'm not contributing. I'm just a mess. Everyone would be better off if I wasn't around. So mm -hmm. it's not so much that you want to die, it's that you don't want the other, you, you feel like you're taking one for the team by taking yourself out of the picture. Now, luckily, I was always able to kind of, I always had that grip on reality where I was like, I would always think, no, if you do that, you're just going to fucking shatter your mother, you know, you're going to pass this on to your brothers. And that's what always stopped me from going through with it. Mm -hmm. But that would, be, that would be my thought process was everyone would be better off without me. So it wasn't it was it wasn't like I wanted out of the game. So what I always kind of say was, if I'd have had a switch that I could just flick a switch, and everyone would be like that kind of thing on Men in Black where they like shoot you with a, yeah. they zap you, and people just forget. If I could have just zapped people and everyone went on and I got taken out of the picture, then that's what I would have done. Mm -hmm. um, now looking back, even talking about it right now, it almost is like it's happened to a different person because now I'm in a good position with my life. You, you're like, how the fuck could I ever have thought that? It's so, it's so alien. It's almost as if it happened to another, another person. And it's, it's really hard because when I talk to people who are going through it now, you're kind of like, bro, you just have to trust me. It's like I know when you're in the middle of it, you just don't see how it can get better. But yeah. I said li literally within two months, you might be looking back on this going, God, how did I ever think that? And it's about trying to help people through that that period it's like it's like taking someone through a rainstorm it's like yeah it's not gonna it's not gonna rain forever it's like but when you're standing there in the middle of it and you're getting soaked it's very hard to think about sunshine yeah um and um 
like I do think that I think that there are some people. Look, at the end of the day, our brain's just a bunch of fucking wire in a circuitry, right? Mm-hmm. There are some people whose circuitry is just going to lead them down a, a, a tragic path. I think that's just inevitable. Yeah. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it's just about being able to try and guide them through that shitty period. Which, like I said, bro, because again, when I look back at that period of my life, doing drugs all the time. Um, no, ho- hopefully no fucking law enforcement people listen to this stop me coming back in the country um, uh, was in an extremely toxic relationship wasn't really doing any kind of meaningful work which gave me purpose there was all these other things and then it was the PTSD on top which I, I'd never been to therapy for I'd like once I'd gone through the therapy once I'd started doing work it gave me purpose mm-hmm. once I started getting on top of my debt once I got out of that toxic relationship things fucking cleared up extremely quickly yeah, people can't see the sunshine, man. They're they're stuck in the storm, and they're just like, it's never coming. It's never gonna come. And it's like going through boot camp and stuff. You're like, it's never gonna fucking end, man. This sucks. <laughs> like, what what, yeah. what what is going on here? Like, I, I want to be anywhere but here. And uh, you just gotta know that the sun's gonna come out, and it's gonna be bright, yeah. and life's gonna be good. If you look at, it, uh, I always look at it like, I look at myself ten years ago. Like, where was I at ten years ago? Mm-hmm. You know, in 2010. I was, you know, I was a Ford observer. I was a brand new Ford observer. I was, you know, completely different. I didn't know anything about being a JTAC. Like I had heard about the job and stuff like that. Didn't know anything about that. I had never gone into, like I went to Iraq once, but I hadn't really done anything. Um, you know, like I'm just completely different than my thought process is different and stuff like that. And like you said, you're a different person and yeah, it's hard for people to see beyond their current situation, but you have to you see know- that I'm growing towards something else. And then this is going to make me stronger. And then when I'm done through this tough spots, I'm going to appreciate everything more. And it's really hard, especially um, like a job like this where I'm on here, I'm constantly, you know, downing my, you know, inside. I'm like, fuck, man, am I doing this right? Like, do people like this? Like, is this sucks? I'm an idiot. Like, you know, it's hard to put yourself out there and stuff like that. But you just have to do it and you have to push through it and know that it's going to be worth it in the, in the long run. And I think mental health is kind of the same way. You just have to push through the dark times and know that on the backside of that, it's, it's all going to be worth it and people are going to be there and like appreciate you being around and stuff like that. And yeah. Um, but you, and here's, here's the other thing though, bro. And this is again, something that like civilians kind of need pointed out to them. There are veterans out there who want to wallow in the dark. Yeah. They don't want to come out. Yeah, like I, I, I've, um, so there's some British, there's some British uh, guys who are, and I'm not saying that they don't have problems, right? Mm-hmm. But they, they, and they're very vocal on Twitter. They make, you know, they make money off this stuff. And I've been contacted by mental health professionals who have said that they've contacted these guys and offered them free counseling and stuff, and they've been turned down by them. They kind of like they, they, they're enjoying like this wallowing in this fucking sadness. And there's, yeah, we have to admit that there's people out, 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 out there doing that. And again, that kind of adds into this whole like douchebaggery that you're kind of talking about because quite, those are the ones that are quite often most vocal about it. And people are like, oh, why aren't they getting the treatment that they need? Well, because they keep turning it down. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, that well, I was thinking more like people. So on Memorial Day here, you see people like, hey, happy Memorial Day, you know, like civilians and dudes are like, it's not a happy Memorial Day. This is an observance. And it's like, okay, dude, we got it. We got it. Like they're just, they're trying to express they're sentiment and yeah. And be like, Hey, I support you guys and I support the cause and you're fucking being a douchebag. Like you're just killing them. You should be like, Hey, I thank you. I appreciate it. Um, you know, and maybe tell them a story if you lost someone, you know, like, Hey, this is, you know, this is who I'm thinking about today or whatever, but dude, people what, are what just about- douchebags. What, what's your what's your thoughts on veteran parking spaces? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't. I used one once. I was like, "Fuck it, this whole you parking lot's sucker. this whole parking lot's full." I well, was at the outlet. Not, I was at well, the I was at the outlet mall in Carlsbad. I had to go get a new shirt. <laughs> Entire parking lot's full. I'm like, "Oh, that's open. Gonna do it." I don't care, man. Like people want to put them up. I just don't think it should be. I'm not. I don't know. I don't. When I go to like a baseball game at the Padres and stuff, they're like, "All oh, the veterans in the crowd stand up," and you know, all these people stand up, and I'm just like, "No oh, way, dude!" Bro, my no, kid, okay, my kid's always like, "Dad, crazy. stand up," you know. And there's nothing wrong with it. They want that's cool. That's cool. I'm that's just not yep. me. That's just not bro, me. I, go, I don't want to be like that. So um, recently, you know, they play the NFL games in London. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I love the fucking NFL, um, and so the Royal, Royal British Legion, who are a big charity, they sponsor my podcast, and um, they know that I'm a big NFL fan. So they got in touch with me and they go, they go, hey, we got a pair of tickets um, for the game if you want them. 
um, there's only one catch. And she goes, I don't think you're going to want the tickets. I'm like, oh, what's the catch? <laughs> she goes, before the game, they're going to announce hero of the game. And, the ca- and then the camera's going to go on to you. And they're going to go and they're going to read out your service as the crowd gives you a round of applause at oh Wembley Stadium. Dude. And I go, I would rather fucking die. And she, she emailed back going, yeah, I thought so. But what I wish I'd done now in retrospect is taken one of my veteran friends and made him the hero of the game <laughs> and not told him. I just totally fucking embarrassed him. <laughs> but, dude, I, I would rather fucking die than have that happen. I would be dying on the inside during that. There's no way. Oh, my God. Your skin would be peeling off and, like, you just face just face melting in embarrassment. I mean, it's. I mean, what I should have done was just taken the tickets and then just until kickoff, just gone and hidden in the toilets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just have the empty seat. Yeah, he's not there. We don't know where he went. Oh yeah. man, no, like, I, fuck, I fuck that shit, bro. Oh my god. I mean, and, but you know what? I don't. I don't hate on the. the if people want to go do that, that's cool, man. And because you know that's everybody's thing. But that's just not me. And no. I just think some guys. And girls just take it too far and take the whole veteran thing. Like they're somehow better than people. It's like, dude, you volunteered to go into a volunteer force. We thank you for your service. Part of your thankfulness is, or part of your, you know, thing is that you get free college and stuff like that. Here's all the benefits. Like, so quit bitching about like, oh, this, this restaurant doesn't give a, you know, a discount. Bro, the or, benefits, the benefits in America and it's insane. Like, I think it's one of, one of my friends he gets a better rate on his loan uh, on his mortgage because his brother served, or what? something like yeah, something like that. I can't remember the exact de- I can't remember the exact details, but basically, my friend was getting a good deal on something because his brother was a Black Hawk pilot. Sounds like a fraud um, case. No, I'm just yeah, like, whatever. But but like, if you're getting a college education out of it, then you've done fucking well. So shut mm-hmm. the fuck. Up. Like it. Th- yeah, I can't complain, man. You get and for the people that don't know what it is, it's. It's 36 months of whatever the most expensive school is in whatever state you're living in, whatever public school. So for here in California, the most expensive public school is UC Berkeley. So whatever Berkeley's tuition rate is what the government will cover. And that Mm -hmm. will cover any state school that you go to, any school within the state. If I decide to go to like USC or a private school like that, then they have a program and not every school does, but they do. They have a program called the yellow ribbon program where they cover the, all the extra part of your tuition. So you don't have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. So you you get 36 months, which equals to four, four years with the summers off. Um, and dude, I mean, I get paid to live here. I get paid, you know, you get paid to live here, which like I had my very first video. That was my second video podcast. I had, I had the, um, one of the SDSU, VA reps come on and the guy that signs the paperwork and talk about it. And like he said, you shouldn't just use BAH, the the money that you get from the, um, from the, the GI bill, that shouldn't be your only income. However, it's a good supplement, you know, and mm-hmm. veterans can put themselves in a really good place if they're going to school full time and they're also working at the same time. Um, it's, it's such a great opportunity it is, and yeah. you can go to you can go to trade schools. You can use it to learn how. Like I was telling somebody on the last podcast, or maybe two before, um, I had a buddy who went to like WyoTech and stuff, and went you know learned how to be a mechanic, you know, a professional mechanic and stuff. And it's just there's a lot of opportunities in the U.S. for veterans, and we're kind of spoiled like that for sure. And it's no, for think, everybody. I think it's amazing, bro. I, re- I I really do. I think it's incredible. I, because I like, the other thing as well is I think once I I think going to especially for guys. Go into college when you've had some life experience and you not actually know what a work day is, mm-hmm. and you know you actually have your goals lined. Uh, you know you you know what you want from life. Yeah, it's the best time to go. Like you're you're much better off going to college when you're in your twenties than when you're a fucking kid. Yeah, I think um, you definitely focus more. I, I I but I also have another way of looking at it. I so I wanted to join when I was eighteen when September eleventh happened and stuff like that. I got arrested for weed and stuff, so I got I got kicked down down the road. Um. But the good thing was, is I lived on my own. Like I moved out of my, my mom's house a few months before I graduated from high school. So I was still in high school and I had moved out. And from that point until I joined the Marine Corps, I was living on my own. I was paying bills. You know, I was learning how to like live. I moved to a different apartment. You know, I had roommates dealing with people, you know, like I just had a lot of life experience. And then I joined the Marine Corps, you know, Mm -hmm. so I joined and I was a little bit older and you see a lot of guys that join And they look back and they're like, dude, like the best part of your life, like that 18 to 22, you're spending it getting told what to do, cleaning and doing Mm, bullshit. 
And I like if my kid was to join or say he wanted to join, I'd be like, look, man, I want you to go to college and at least go to like the community college and get an associate's degree, spend two years there, get some life experience, work a job, you know, because be accountable, be accountable. And then, and then go, because it's only going to make you a better, um, you know, military member and just a better, better person all, all around. Um, that's good advice, bro. Uh, I gotta take a piss, man. Give me one sec. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Now that we had like a natural pause, let's go back and start, um, with your military career. Let's, let's talk about you some let's, what year did you join and how does it work for you? You joined the, the army, right? The British army. I, I joined the army reserves. Okay. Sort of like the equivalent of the guard. Um, I joined that while I was, uh, um, I guess my senior kind of like senior year in high school. Okay. Um, and then, so the, originally I wanted to become, uh, an officer in the infantry. And this is like, uh, this, this is like 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to be an officer. So I was going to, um, I was going to do like the college kind of like an ROTC equivalent. But then I was, um, I was kind of like told that if I joined the reserves and when in like enlisted, I'd actually get a much better chance to understudy officers. So they, this was back when you used to have radio men. So they put me as the radio man so I could just like understudy the officer. Um, and like you, the reserves was the, like the level of training was higher than what like the ROTC equivalent was. Um, so I did that for a few years while I was in college. But while I was in college, 9-11 happened, Iraq happened. And um, I had some, I went forward to do the commissions board. Um, you know, the regiment, like there was a regiment, my, my local regiment liked me. They wanted to have me an officer as an officer, went to the commissions board. Um, I did not feel like I fit in at all with the other people there. Most people were from, um, they were, they were like privately educated. Um, I'm from like a kind of like middle-class family, but like most of my friends were like kind of like working class. And Mm -hmm. I just, I am, and I just, I felt like the, you know, there's still like quite a bit of a class system in the UK, especially in the army, in the army, the class system is very strong. Um, Really, most of the enlisted ranks are uh, working class from working class families, and then most officers are middle class and um, like what you are basically like your aristocracy. You know, you got your fucking lords and barons and shit like that. And, <laughs> and um, you know, put it this way: I'm the only enlisted. I'm the only enlisted soldier I ever met with a degree who chose to be enlisted. Oh, really? Oh, really? It just doesn't happen. Oh, um, no. And um, like for years, I was like pestered into taking a commission, um, which I just I just didn't want to do. I wanted to be enlisted. I wanted to be machine gunner. Like mm-hmm. I did what? Um, but that just doesn't really happen in the in, in the British Army so much. It, it is def- the, definitely there's certain regiments that it's very strong in, but you know across it, it's still very much kind of class system based, um, which I'm I don't agree with at all. I think it should be mer- you know like a meritocracy, um, but it's because like look, dude. Any fucker can get a degree. Getting a degree does not mean that you are a fucking neuroscientist, right? Yeah. You know, you um, and you'll get these guys who are from. They've gone to. Um, they've gone. Been, they've been privately educated at places like Eton, uh, Eton College, and then they will go to. They'll go through the commissions board. Now, don't get me wrong; they still have to pass the commissions board. But even so, there's a lot of all boys club at play and that kind of thing. And. Um, I, I just didn't want a part of that. I wanted to be enlisted. I wanted to be, I always say like, I wanted to be the guy kicking in the door, not the guy saying, go and kick in the door. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I used the reserves as a back door to get to Iraq. Um, the army being the army, my paperwork got fucked up for about 18 months. So I ended up sitting at home waiting to go hurry up and wait for about a year and a half. Finally got out there and I got sent to a unit, which I really didn't want to be with. Made some good friends, don't get me wrong, but the job that they were doing, this was uh, summer of 2006 and things were going wild. Uh, sorry, winter of 2006, things were going wild. And um, like the, the job that we did was, was we did like a lot of fucking like kind of like base defense stuff. It was okay. fucking boring. Uh, I got lucky and I managed to get out. I, I worked with uh, ATO, uh, EOD and stuff for a bit. I got like a detachment to them. So that, that was good. I got to do some good jobs. Um, but it was extremely frustrating for me. Like I spent like a lot of that tour in like, do you guys call them Sangers? What do you call like a, like a guard tower kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, we don't call them Sangers, but I know what you're talking about. So like I'd be standing in one of those and I'd just be like watching this fucking huge, like fucking firefights going on, tracer flying everywhere. Mm-hmm. And like, you're at, you're just like sitting there on the edge. It's like, it was like, I don't even know if it was like being on the bench 
for a fucking sports game, it was like being in the crowd. Yeah. It's, it sucked. It was so frustrating. So I stayed on. Uh, I did back-to-back tours in Iraq. Um, and then the next unit they put me in was the – that was the unit that was doing the strike operations and, you know, the going into the city, summer 2007, Iraq. What city? Uh, Basra. Okay. That's what I figured. Yeah. And so it was pretty gnarly. Um, I didn't see much of it. I spent most of my time in the back of a warrior, which is like a Bradley. Yeah. And then I'd kind of run out, run out, kick kick something over, see if it was an ID, run back in. <laughs> no, uh, I'm you good. Know, it, was, it was the guys guys in the turret were getting a lot of fun. You know, guys in the turret were, with a 30 mil cannon. Yeah. Wax, machine gun. They got a lot of fun. Um, and then I, stay, I pretty much stayed on with the unit then. We went out to, well, sorry, I stayed on for a bit. Then I got out and then I started working in a gym. And then I saw a warrior bulldozing its way through a wall in Afghanistan on the news. And I was like, oh, God, that looks fucking good. Um, I, took a, I got a position to start with North Wales Police. So I was supposed to start training with them. Um, dropped out of that, told my parents that they canceled the intake. And uh, mm-hmm. they went, instead went, um, went back to the unit, went back to Afghanistan. Oh, sorry, went to Afghanistan, went there in summer 2009. Uh, to, where were you at? Um, just south of Muscala, mostly. Okay. Yeah, I never made it up to Musa Kale. I was up in um uh, Sangin Valley, up there by uh what'd you guys call it? Fuck, I don't remember the name of the base. It's Jackson, Fob Jackson, right there yep. in the middle of Sangin. I would move all the way up north to an area called Puse. That's about the farthest north I went. Um, which probably wasn't there when you were there, so um yeah, man. How, what would you think about the difference between Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh IDs were different. In, Af- in in Iraq, it was mostly EFPs we were dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, then obviously, it was uh, the kind of like it was all the underbelly pressure plate ones um, in Afghanistan. So that was different. Terrain was different. I mean, in Basra, you know, you like a lot of these Iraqi cities. These fucking, you know, you're looking at hundreds of windows <laughs> sometimes, and the, you know, you could be really, really built. You in re- like a really built up part of a city. In Afghanistan, the area where excuse me, I'm about to poop, and the area we were in was really rural. So, like a lot of the time, it was just like open fields, ridge lines. Mm-hmm. Um, still couldn't see the fucking enemy most of the time because they're firing through bunkers or firing from murder holes. And yeah, then the, uh, there was the green zone, but we had a green zone in Basra too. So there was green zone around the as a city there. So that was kind of similar. Um, Overall, I felt it was the same. I felt like both operations, I felt like we fought with our hands tied behind our back. Uh, mm-hmm. at both operations, I felt like the enemy had all of the, um, or most of the kind of um, forward momentum. I felt like we were we were reactive rather than proactive. Um, I felt like both places, it was all for nothing. Um, so, for instance, when we were in Iraq, spent the, you know, the nine months I was there, we lost a lot. Like it was like a guy. There was a guy from the battle, like a guy a die a week kind of thing. Oh really? Um, yeah, but it wasn't reported at all. So there was, I think it was 179 British deaths in Iraq. Um, but if you actually look at the timeline, most of those come in that 2006, 2007, hmm. um, and it was gnarly. Like there was like a lot of like fucking like there was rocket attacks all the time, IDF all the time, uh, IEDs every day. Like there was a lot of casualties going on. And we were, you know, there were strike operations going on, taking the bad guys out of their houses, capturing all these bad guys. And then in the summer of 2007, the British government, without telling the Iraqi government, made a deal with the Jaysh al-Mahdi, who were the main militia that we were fighting, made a deal with them that we would leave Basra. So we left the city, um, which none of us wanted to do. We wanted to, obviously the blokes, we wanted to be fucking, we wanted to be let off the leash. We wanted to fucking take the fight to them. So we had to leave the city. Uh, and then after that, we had to hold the gate open and let these guys walk out. These guys that we'd been losing guys to, to, to capture. We had to literally, they had us stand by the gate, open the gate and let them walk out. Uh, it was, it was horrible. Um, and while we were there as well, so bear in mind to go into Basra city, we used to have challenger main battle tanks, at least a company's worth of warrior armored vehicles, Apaches overhead, fast jets overhead, 105, um, sorry, 10, what, what were they? The... 150, 155 millimeter guns mm-hmm. on um, with pre des targets. We have all of that going on, and our rules of engagement were: you can only fire if fired upon, and you can positively identify the shooter, and he's still a threat. So basically, they'd have trucks full of their guys driving past us, which nothing like nothing you can do about it. 
as they're driving up to take firing positions, all of that stuff. We we were in the middle of a city where we're on, we're constantly under attack. We were on the same rules of engagement as a guy guarding a reserve center in London. Mm-hmm. It yeah, was insane. It's um, I think a lot of that came down. So there. There was a lot of uh, a lot of people talk about how the British worked in in Afghanistan and how the Marines came in and had to take over areas like Sangin and Muskela and stuff like that, and how the the strategy there was like what you said: stay on the base, maybe do some p- local patrols, like ride around the base, just sec- local security patrols and stuff like that, but not really push out. Well, we didn't and, have the numbers. We didn't make. We didn't have. We didn't have the numbers. So for yeah. us to for us to launch a patrol from our patrol base. We had to leave. We could. We to, so to get like twelve guys together to go out on a patrol. It meant leaving three guys in the patrol base. That was the so other like thing that, that you guys we had so, so many. We were so overstretched. Yeah, instead of having instead of having like one main like fob and running patrols out of that, you guys had patrol bases like all over the place and and mm-hmm. thinned yourselves out. That's that sucks because then you just sit on the walls and watch people build the fences and put in IEDs and there's like nothing you can do about it. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have enough money. It was a classic case of officers coloring in maps and saying, we've got guys in all these places. It's like, yeah, but we can't, we couldn't even control a hundred meters past where we're at because anything that you can't directly see, like it would be an IED. So like that wall, a hundred meters away, there's going to be an IED behind it. We can go and clear it today. We go back tomorrow. There's going to be another IED there. Yeah. And like that, so and quick li- and, and living, but living that way, is very hard mentally because you just know that like you're constantly on the back foot and we 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 be pissed off because this guys you know we were like a reconnaissance platoon we'd be saying like like let three of us go out we'll go out for the night let us fucking go out let us take we'll take a fucking we'll go out three of us will strip down our kit and we'll go out and we'll go and sit on that fucking we'll go and sit around that corner and we'll go but they had their rules oh you can only go out if there's 12 people and all this and it's like we're asking you let, we feel more safe by being proactive and going out in like fucking three of us. Let yeah. us go and do that. Yeah, you got to take the fight to them for sure. But we but we weren't allowed to do it. I got fucking, I got, sorry, I got fucking pissed off fucking thinking about this, dude. Like, because I just think it was all for nothing. It was all for nothing. And it was, it didn't need to be that way. And it pisses me off. The same situation in Basra, same situation in Helmand. We wanted to fucking be taking the fight to them. Mm-hmm. I, like, and that's what I say. I genuinely feel like, because every time we got a chance to get at the fuckers, we'd fucking smoke them. <laughs> like, yeah, they, like, they weren't they they couldn't stand and fight at all. But not not only that, dude. But like one of the problems we'd have is like when the patrol base did get attacked, you it's not a question of like finding enough guys to get up and fire. You're having to pull guys down because mm-hmm. it's, everyone wants to fucking fight. Like I feel like the British soldier over the last twenty years has been absolutely mismanaged. And um, just severely let down by command and by the, by government. You think so? Yeah, I think you know one thing I do like about the British Army is that your soldiers, once you enlist, you can stay in and stay at that same rank like as long as you want, right? Like you can. Yeah, I, I stayed a lance corporal. I had no intent. I did twelve years at lance you know, corporal. I had we, no intention of moving. We force people out at ten years. Like if you're not a staff sergeant, I think I think it's unless it's changed. It was like ten years. If you're not a staff sergeant, then they kick you out. You know, it's like here's separation pay. Thanks for coming. Good luck out there. And I'm like, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing because one, you're, I think guys should be able to stay in and I think it should be harder for guys to get promoted. I like that you guys have less ranks and stuff like that because we, we have guys that stay in and they're at like six years. And for some reason, you know, even if they suck, people aren't saying that they suck enough or our systems is so broken that it just lets people promote through the ranks, even though they're no good. Yeah. Uh, and there's no stoppage to it. But if I think if you let someone stay a Lance Corporal for 20 years, you know, then that would be easier to manage because you know that this guy can still stay in and retire if he wanted yeah. to. But I don't know. Well, one of the, one of the things we do as well is it's like, you can stay a Lance Corporal, but there might be a point where they need you to step up and do a, a full corporal or even a sergeant's job. Yeah. And if they know you're competent, then they'll just tell you to do it. Yeah. Like, so it's, and then it's like, that well, always works that it, way though. Yeah. And then it's like, and then it's like, it's on, cause you could make, well, you could again complain that you're not getting paid as a sergeant or you made the choice to not do the promotion course. <laughs> so yeah. if they know you, it's like I did a fucking, I replaced on my first tour, I replaced the full corporal. Um, I took, I got taken off a job. I was really enjoying with the ATO to take over a section because the co- full corporal was useless. So I, I, I was in command of this full corporal. He's taking full corporal pay. 
Um, and I've even seen it with a sergeant from the reserves who was doing a private's job and there was Lance Corporal commanding him. Yeah. So there, there's kind of that. But, you know, I just, I, um, I, I was there for the experience. I wasn't there for a career. I was there for the tours and that was it. I wanted to do a career. I had planned on coming in and staying in. I was like, you know what? Especially after my second enlistment, I was like, you know what? I'll probably end up staying in. Mm. But then I did two back-to-back deployments on ship, man, and it was just so bad. And seeing how, I don't know, man, I I just felt like I was being wasted. Like my time was wasted. My time with my kid was wasted because I did five deployments between 2009 and 2016, Mm -hmm. you know, and just being gone so much. And and when you go on a ship deployment, like I would have went back to Afghanistan, but going on ship, it's like – there's nothing going on most of the time. You're sitting there. You're just fucking like sitting there Like you say, waiting. you waste, waste your time. It's yeah. like a waste. It's, it's, it's the prime of your life. Excuse me. It's prime of your life. And you're never getting those those back. And like, okay, yeah, you might have to do one. That's fair enough. But when they start giving back-to-back ones and stuff, then that's just when, especially if you're someone like you said, you, know, like, you like to be busy. You have all these projects on the go. Yeah. It's it's worse than being, it's worse than prison. Like <laughs> at least in prison, you can go, like, you can get stuff done. Well, well I bridge. You know, British ones anyway. I just felt like I just felt like I wasn't like my capabilities weren't being utilized, and I felt like that I was being downgraded a lot, a, 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 multiple times. I felt like anything that my contributions that I could have given to the Marine Corps or to my unit weren't being taken because I was an enlisted guy too. And I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna be like some second class citizen to to some people. Um, and I. I don't know. I was I always had a chip on my shoulder um, for a lot of officers because some dudes are real douchebags about being officers and like uh, you know they got the uh, holier than thou kind of attitude about it. So a lot of them are great. I, I had a fortunate opportunity to work with a lot of great officers, but there's a lot of bad officers out there. And going on ship just really amplifies all of that. You really find out about people because they they maintain like a military hierarchy that. No one else does in the military. Like going into the chief's mess, you can't go in there unless you're a chief. You know what I'm saying? You don't even look in there. Officer's mess, can't even go in the officer's, you know. It's just a weird world. And I I just walked away from being on ship and stuff with a bitter taste in my mouth. And I was like, fuck this. This is a waste of my time. And I feel like the machine doesn't care about me. So I'm kind of done with it. I feel like I've done my part and I'm just going to cut loose now before I'm too old where I'm you know, if I would have stayed in, I could have retired at 42. So now I'm 42 coming out of a combat arms job. Like what, what would a 42 year old coming out of combat arms job going to do? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not that, (laughs) you know, I'm not too far behind that, but at least now I'm in school and stuff. And so it's just a decision every person has to make, you know, and everybody's situation is different and, and stuff like that. But it's tough, man. It's tough on my kid, tough on the family, tough on my mom, you know, everybody. It's just tough when you're gone. Like I said, five deployments and it was just, I enjoyed a lot of it. Like a lot of it was cool until I got on ship, you know, ship was just fucking prison. When you were, when you were doing private security on ship, do you go and stay on the ship? Like the whole, you're not on it the entire voyage, right? Or you just fly out for one portion of the voyage. Like the most, I'd be on it usually from Egypt to Sri Lanka. How long does that take? Yeah. It depends on the ship too. Like these ships only do like a lot of them only do like 13 knots. Mm. So, um, I can't remember exactly, but, but you could be doing stops in the Middle East and stuff. Like sometimes I'd be on the ship for like six, I think six weeks maybe without getting off. Oh, okay. Uh, you might do. So you do like a decent amount of time on there. And you're locked down too. So you're locked down into the, you know, the superstructure on the back of the ship. Yeah. Like that's, you're locked down to that area there. The um, entire so basically, time? Yeah, yeah. So the only, the only place you can really go out and get air is on the bridge wings. You know, on the side of the cabin. Yeah, so, you definitely find places to get air and stuff while you're on a ship. It's all the well, little you, nooks and you, you stuff. You do watch up there. You know, you do when it was like you you do three nine, you do three on nine off or four on eight off usually. Uh, and then I started to do some two man jobs as well. So you we do uh, six on six off. Did you did you ever have any inter- encounters with pirates? Uh, yes, but not like uh, not like gunfights. Yeah, um, they they. In the early days, you'd see them fairly regularly. They'd kind of come out, and you'd see them just they, – they'd just be scoping you out. Yeah. Um, and what you do is you stand on the bridge wing, and you hold your weapon up, and they just didn't want any part of that. Yeah. They're not, they're not fucking stupid. They knew they were just going to get lit up. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's got to be a – that's a weird t- – coming in on like a little dinghy and, and taking over a ship. That's such a crazy well, I'm, thing. I'm glad that – honestly, like at the time, I was still trigger happy. You know, like at the time, I was like – I had the nice – I had some – you know, I had some nice weapons that we had uh, – 
some nice weapons on the ships. We had like L nights, the L ninety six Accuracy International, and um, sometimes we have um, Remington seven hundreds, which I, I like. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was kind of like, yeah, I quite want to fucking shoot a pirate. That'd be cool. Say so shot pirates, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, I quite wanted to do that. Now I look back on it, I think, oh fuck, I've like, why shoot a pirate so that like a company like Shell can make, you know, five hundred and one million instead of five hundred million, and this fucking Pirates just probably trying to fucking get some like those guys. Those guys just get if they successfully hijack a ship, they just get like a small pe- small amount of money. It's the warlords and stuff that get the most of it. These guys are just trying to fucking feed the families. And so I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad it never came to the point where. Um, because I never I've never felt bad about pulling a trigger on tour, but I think I would have felt I think I would have felt bad about um, pulling one on those guys. Really, you yeah. became sympathetic towards their cause. Yeah, fuck, dude, fucking. I'm not saying that like I'm not saying that I, I think that it's, they they can do what they want and fucking hijack pirates, tactics. Yeah. But I'm glad the fact I'm glad that it was just a show of force was enough to scare them off. I'm glad that nobody yeah. had that. Oh, for you sure. Know? Yeah, that's such a weird thing, man. What a I see. I always thought. I, I, well, I always wondered. Like you, we went through a phase where you'd hear about hijackings constantly and ships getting yeah. taken over by pirates constantly, well, and then I've it died friends, off. Yeah, I've I've had friends who have been like they. I've had friends who have been boarded. Like so, they, oh, really? they did they did unarmed jobs. So early earlier on, it was like the guys were doing unarmed jobs, and you basically be there as a consultant about how to like basically like turn the try and turn the ship into a bit of a fortress. Um, yeah, and like some one of my some of my friends got up, they got RPG'd a few times, uh, and then they they locked themselves in the engine room, and the, the pirates came on board. Uh, but the, then a Dutch um, a Dutch commando team came and uh, scared the pilots off uh, pirates off. But yeah, they actually got boarded. That's fucking crazy. That's pretty wild. I knew a guy on my first Mew, on my first time deploying on ship, and I keep saying Mew, that's Marine Expeditionary Unit, for those that don't know. That's when we go out on a ship deployment with the Navy. Um, One of the recon guys that was on the ship, he was part of the recon team that went and took over, went went and took a ship back from the pirates. Hmm. Like, they boarded and went in, and and I was like, that's sick, dude. Like, how many people would say they went and took over a pirate ship? Like, that's weird. Well, dude, it it was cool because it was... It actually, it, it was hard on my, it was hard on my, um, I, f- I find it very hard to like meet chicks, especially in my hometown, like California, <laughs> not so much because California people like out here do like, you know, people out here do all kinds of fucking shit. But in my hometown in Wales, it'd be like, oh, so what, what, where have you been for the last few weeks? Why haven't you been answering my text? Well, because I've been on a ship. We've been on a, doing a ship. Well, stopping pirates from taking <laughs> it. Like, oh, fuck you, asshole. Yeah, sure you yeah. have. Yeah. So like I actually have people, I've actually had people stand me up because they go, I've decided that you're full of shit. I'm like, because it'd be like, it'd be like, oh, I'm a, I like, um, it's like what? Oh, so you're, uh, so you go on ships to stop pirates coming on, and then you're going out to LA because you're getting a TV show made. I'm like, well, yeah. But like, like, some but, people are doing stuff. Yeah, some people do stuff, like motherfucker. But yeah. yeah, it's quite, it's quite funny. But yeah, it was, it's a cool, it was a, it was a cool. Like the the early days of the job were fucking amazing because uh, the money was good to get five hundred bucks a day, um, and when when you'd go ashore, like because we, we used to go to India a lot, mm-hmm. you'd be allowed to go ashore, and you might be ashore, you might get four or five days ashore, and you're getting paid five hundred bucks a day. You can't spend a hundred bucks a day in fucking India. How's a port call so, in India? Fucking awesome. We went to. I don't know if you ever heard of Goa in India. It's absolutely like just paradise. Oh really? Like palm trees, white beaches. And there's some like because we meet like a lot of Brits there who went on holiday. Yeah. And, and like every day, dude, we'd just be we'd just be drinking every day. We'd be eating fresh seafood, and you still couldn't spend a hundred bucks. Yeah. It was it was awesome, but those days didn't last very long. Then it went down to uh, my last job I did. I was on a tugboat with seventy other people. Uh, most of them were Indian and Sri Lankan. Um, they all had DMV because none of them washed their hands. Um, they all had they all had DMV, which is diarrhea and vomiting for people who don't know. And you'd be in like bunks of like twelve people. They just farting and spitting all day. It was fucking gross. And I was one hundred and fifty bucks. And I was like, there is no way that I was like, I can make one hundred and fifty bucks doing a few hours personal training. Like, what the fuck am I doing on this boat? Yeah. So that cockroaches everywhere. That was the last one I fucking did. Oh yeah, they had an open fire going on the back of the boat, and there was a shark circling. And I was just like, yeah, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. You're like, what kind of operation is this thing? Jesus. Yeah, we I called know. that uh, sickness the Double Dragon. That's what the uh, <laughs> that's the name of it for U.S. Navy ships. We I never the even, Double Dragon. Dude, I never even got in Afghanistan. Never got 
Never got a bad stomach. Oh, puke. Never got it. But a lot of our guys didn't. Like, in Iraq, yeah. every, everyone got in Iraq. And I think it was from the catering because you get catered together. So if someone, with, as someone has got it there and they're handling your food, mm. a lot of people are going to get it. Whereas in Afghanistan, because we were eating rations and you're just handling your own shit, yeah. you, you had a lot like... Because the thing is, like, who's doing your food in Iraq? It's the fucking... Like these these caterers, they come in and you'd see that they they wash their ass with their ha- fucking hands. So of course there's going to get fucking g- germs going to get spread. But actually, when it came down to eating out ration packs, because you know we just had ration packs for the, you know for the in the fobs in the PB. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody got like very few people got sick. You guys didn't have um, you guys don't have like cooks or something that come down to the base level no, and no, make. No, we we did we did uh, we actually. Um, it's actually kind of like a bit of a scandal because at Christmas time when we were out there, the prime minister had made a big announcement on BBC saying that every soldier in Helmand had been delivered like a Christmas dinner, yeah. uh, which was bullshit. And some of our guys told the parents that and the parents went to the newspapers and the newspapers were going to run a story about it. But then we all got in trouble <laughs> because apparently you're not t- supposed to tell the truth. OPSEC, uh, bro. Yeah. There. Protect right. the yeah. system. What if what if the Taliban find out that you didn't get your Christmas dinner? Like, they, but yeah, like but it's just ridiculous, dude. It's just one of those things. I just thought, like, what the fuck is going on in this fucking circus? Yeah, it's a mess. It's funny. Uh, when you're out there, the food that you get, like, the U.S. is really good about actually getting everybody a meal, like a Christmas meal, even if it's like, you know, instant mashed potatoes and like a slice of ham. You know, they try to get that. They try to push that food down to the lowest level. Uh, yeah, to sweet. those bases that are out the farthest um, we had cooks but they would it was basically like dudes that boiled big bags of food and then served it to you yeah. um, and then every once in a while they would do like eggs or something they'd cook a bunch of like an actual breakfast but most of the time you're getting like a scoop of whatever you know whatever yeah. boiled bag they had that day yeah. um, no, I remember- we, had, we, had, we, we had the 24 like 24 hour ration pack like that you just get one every day oh yeah. was it the clear bag no, no, it comes in a box and then the bags are like green. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, never mind. But some, of, some, of them are, some of them are pretty good. Some I've, heard like, the, some those... I've heard the UK, the British meals are really good. Yeah, I've got a fucking big box. I've got a box of uh, cold weather MREs next to me now. They fucking suck. You know, I've never had one of the cold weather ones. No, my friend, my friend fucking, uh, my friend had a box of them. So I've just, uh, I've been like, just been interested. So I've just been nosing through them. But no, the British ration packs, they used to, they sucked when I first joined in 2000. They were fucking atrocious. Mm-hmm. But um, to be fair, they got, they, they, were, they were pretty fucking good by the time I left. And, yeah. You know, I, I, had no, I had no problem eating them whatsoever. In the fact, MR- I had too much. I got fucking fat. Yeah, they are, they're bad for you. They, the MREs aren't too bad. The meals ready to eat that we get are, aren't aren't too bad. People bitch about them more than you know. They just like to bitch. So exactly bitching about food in the army or in the military, army, marines, anything is just like a tradition. <laughs> so well, well, uh, well, like those is, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? I don't know. Anyway, our our rations aren't too bad. But when I was in Marja, we got stuck getting uh, first strike meals, is what they're called, and it's twenty four hours of rations all in one big clear bag. But it's all like bread. I mean, mm. everything is just wrapped in bread. It's like sausage sandwich, but it's like a basically like a beef stick wrapped in bread, you know? So it's, and that's all we, ha- there's only two kinds. One has a pouch of chicken in it, and one has a pouch of tuna in it. And then everything else is just like snack bread bullshit. Mm. And that's all we had to eat for a month. So every day it was one or the other. And it was just like, Poop. I got to a point. I was like, fuck this. I'm not eating. Like, you know, I didn't get a care package when mail came in. I'm like, damn it. Like, I'm starving yeah. out here, you know? <laughs> oh, God. We, we, we got so much food coming out. Because back then, the, the UK public was sending, like, care packages. Mm-hmm. So you'd get, like, an entire class of kids would send our care packages. I and mean, it was just like, we just had too much. Yeah. Like, it was, but, like, it, it worked out because it all just went to the local kids. Yeah. Like yeah, those, a lot kids, of it does, yeah. those kids have probably got no fucking teeth now because, well, actually they should do because we gave them to, because we'd have like so much toothpaste and candy coming in and yeah. shower gel. They did send so, socks and toothpaste for sure. That's all that stuff. A lot of care so, packages. Have that well, stuff we used in to it. get sent minute, like they'd sneak miniatures. They'd sneak alcohol in there too. Nice. So like, yeah, we'd stockpile those and at Christmas we got fucking lit. Uh, but um, yeah, like they'd sneak those in. they used to send them in like um, uh, mouthwash bottles and stuff. Yeah. Be cool. We, so, to your writing, when did you start? Were you writing while you were 
uh, in journal, the army? Journal, journaled in Afghanistan. Yeah. Didn't write. I, kept, I kept my journals. Probably like my prized possession now. Do you... Uh, um, are you going to publish that at any point or anything it's from been, it? It's been, it's been published. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, my book, uh, Brothers in Arms, came out uh, last May, I want to say. May, June. Came out last year. Okay, uh, gotcha. Yeah, it did, uh, Pam, published by Pam McMillan in the UK. Um, I've just self-published it in the US So because um, I only sold the rights to it for the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've just self-published it um, in the US and... Yeah, um, it's called, uh, it should be, so, so it's on Amazon, Geraint Jones, Brothers in Arms, Machine Gunner at War. Uh, but yeah, it's up, on, it's up on there. So yeah, I, I basically just used those journals to, um, I used those journals and then I fleshed it out and I talked, I talked about, I, I, about the last third of the book is is post-tour stuff as well because I wanted to talk through the kind of like the down the downhill slope, but then mm-hmm. coming out the other side of it as well because I think a lot of stuff out there just concentrates on even concentrates on it's all good or it's all bad whereas obviously the reality of life is we have a bit, bit of both and i wanted to show that you can go through some shit after the tour but then you can come out of it not just like okay but actually a lot better than how you went into it yeah for sure for sure how many books do you have out now uh i think it's big pushing 10 pushing maybe. 10 huh did yeah. you did you always want to be a writer or is this something that just kind of you fell into i wanted to be a soldier i you know i wanted to be a soldier but i wanted to be a soldier on operations yeah no, I didn't want to be a barrack soldier. Exactly. So, um, writer's kind of like a close second. Like, I'd rather be on operations. Like, yeah. that's why I'd rather be doing But if I can't be on operations, then being, writer, being a writer is a pretty good job. And, dude, I'm fucking 36 now. Like, I have to admit that I can't do the stuff that I used to do yeah. physically. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of miles on these fucking knees yeah. and stuff. I, um, I, I think we underestimate just how much bo- shit our bodies can put up with when we're in our 20s and teens. You know, like, we used to do stuff where it'd just be like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of, like, Exercise Canberra Patrol. I think it's, like, 70 kilometers over 48 hours in, like, really bad terrain, really bad weather, huge amount of kit. You've got to do stands along the way. And it'd just be like, all right, off you go. No training for it or anything. And you just do it. Yeah. And, like, now, I'm like, I went for a run on the beach the other day. I'm like, oh, my hip, oh, my knees. No, <laughs> no, no equipment, no nothing. It's just, like, some people can do it. Like, don't get me wrong. But I just think... Your body can just do so much when you're in your early twenties, and For just sure. put up with such. And you, it can, it can live on fucking rippets and dip, and like that's what like, and like your body can just survive. You're putting just poison in your body all the time, and just mistreating it, but it'll cope. Yeah. Um, but now, even if like you know, I, I keep on top of my, I, I'm more on top of my fitness now than I was at that age. But it's just, you know, things, things are break. You know, thirty six years old. If you lived in the animal kingdom, would probably be quite like a long quite an old age you know yeah well you also forget i mean you don't take into account a lot of people don't take into account how physical being in the military is just just day to day like wearing kit going and moving gear around doing stuff that the average person's not doing they're getting off their couch they're going to work probably sitting at a desk or something you know obviously there's trades and stuff that are out there pounding hammers and stuff all day long but a lot of people aren't doing anything like that and then you leave the military and you go from you know, constantly doing something, going out and doing field exercises and stuff like that and, and everything to not. And it's just, yeah, you start to naturally deteriorate too. It's just, mm-hmm. yeah, it sucks. Uh, I, I, I found like, it, I, I found that the dip the last year, I felt like something like there was like a switch phone last year. And, um, I felt like metabolism really slowed down and I felt like injuries and stuff started to become a lot more I started, mm-hmm. I had one injury to my, to my calf. Like I was running across the road and I just heard this like crack, like a gunshot. And it was, uh, I torn, tore my calf. Um, oh, which I felt that, yeah, I fell down in the middle of the road as well. I was fucking lucky. There was like nothing coming. Um, and, uh, since then there's then probably from that, there's then just been a knock and then it's been my knee. Then it's been this, there's been the back. And I, cause it's like, once that one thing went then there's just been like a knock on, yeah. a, a knock on of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, now, like, dude, even now during this lockdown, I'm putting on fucking weight like fuck. And I'm, I'm trying to exercise twice a day. I'm still putting on fucking weight. There's one like those insanity workouts and stuff, all those P90X videos. and Yeah, P90X, yeah. Make, make use of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so what was the first book you wrote and what was it like, like putting, putting your work out there? Because as someone that's, you know, I'm obviously putting content out into the world and people are judging me for it, you know, or judging what I do and stuff. 
it's tough, you know, at first to break through that initial barrier of you, of you telling yourself that you can't do it. So what was it like to like have a book written and go, you know what, I want to publish this and I want to put it yeah. out there for the world to, to see. Well, I've never had the, I can't do it. I always knew that I could do it. Yeah. So I've never had that. I've always thought, um, I think I'm very quite self-aware of what I'm good at and what I'm not. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think I was, I, I read so much that that's, kind of like my education on how to write but also I, I do think it's just I think we're all born with certain talents in some things I think I had a certain amount of talent with soldiering wasn't the best definitely wasn't the worst um and I had I have a talent for writing I just have like a natural talent for it and so I knew objectively that it was like I could write and I knew that a lot of books get published and if I just fucking sit down and do it it'll get published like I just saw it as simple as that now, yeah. that didn't mean that I thought it was going to be a fucking bestseller or anything, but I yeah. knew that it would get, I knew that it would become a thing. So the first book that I wrote was actually, I started writing my Afghanistan book. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to get it out of my head anyway. So it just made sense that that was the thing to write. But I also knew that it wasn't the right time for, I, I kind of watch how the markets go and I knew that it wasn't the right time to publish an Afghanistan book or to try and get one published. Mm-hmm. So I used that as basically my calling card to say, look, this is what I can, this is how I can write. Then that, that got me a meeting with Penguin and then, um, sorry, I got my agents and then we got a meeting with Penguin and I sat down with them and they were like, yeah, we well, you, you know, they would, they agreed that it wasn't the right time to publish that kind of book. Uh, but they were like, well, what else are you interested in? I was interested in Roman history. So I wrote a book about the Roman legions from uh, from the Grunt's point of view because there's a lot of books out there, fictional books from Caesar's point of view, and you know you get all these like books from you know these generals' point of views and emperors' point of views, and I was like, well, what about the fucking Grunts? Yeah, you know what 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 would it be like to be a fucking Grunt? Oh, and so I I wanted to to do it from section level because like the British Army, the uh, Romans worked on eight man sections, and I quite like that. So I got to, I like, I'm, I've read as many war memoirs as I can get my hands on from anything from, um, there's some, that, so there's some from, um, from Roman era to Napoleonic era to, you know, World War II, Vietnam, a lot like soldiering, the, the methods might change, but the character of soldiers does not seem to change. Yeah. And I thought I want to, um, I, I, I thought I want to. I want my, I want to write about a Roman section, and um, that's what I did. I've got so I've got series going on. Penguin published the first couple. Um, they made me an offer for the third one, but I actually decided to self-publish it because I think self-publishing gets a bad name because a lot of people that can't write will self-publish. I mean, like, there's a lot of books out there that shouldn't be because, like, look, I'd love to be an NFL player. I can't be an NFL player, and I shouldn't be an NFL player. Yeah. Um, but there's no way of me self-publishing being an NFL player. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where it's like people who should not be pu- 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 their work is not good enough to be public. They can self-publish, and it's given self-publishing a bad name. But there's act there's a lot of pros about doing it. You know, you can you can release when you want. You can release a lot more quickly. You can you can. You can change it like so. Like publishers will be well. If it's a historical fiction book, it needs to be a hundred thousand words. Why does it? Why does it need to be a hundred thousand words? Why can't it be sixty thousand? Why can't it be two hundred thousand? You know. So it lets you kind of like have more control over that. Um, and um, yeah, I use the same copy editor as Penguin used because they're freelance. I use the same cover designer, so it looks exactly the same. And but I put it out. I put it out myself. The the latest one. So that's kind of been. That's been, that's been different because it does help to like instead of having an advance from them, you know, and then getting paid up front to do it, I've had to lay out money to do it. Yeah. So I, I am in profit on it just about, but I'm looking at it like over the next forty years. Yeah. I think over the next forty years, I think that will be a lot better financially for me. I got to take another piss, dude. <laughs> Go ahead, man. So, yeah. So I did the um, self-published Roman series. Um, also self-published a book that I do with. Uh, uh, Vinnie Vargas, you know, um, Vinnie, the uh, actor, ex-ranger guy. Okay. Um, and uh, so we did one together. Again, we just wanted to try something different. So we did a short story. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a short story, put that out there. Um, writing then, is a writing is a, like a really good, like long tail economics kind of thing. You know, it's definitely an investment that's a long term. Like I'm, this is a financial stream that a lot of work up front. I mean, how much, when you're writing a book, how much are you writing a day? 
it's it that that's a tough one. So like I can write a book in a month um, if I isolate myself and if I isolate myself and get in a good rhythm. Mm-hmm. I do, I tend to so I tend to binge write. So I might not write for a couple of months and then I'll sit down for four or five weeks and I'll just crank out a book. Um, I, I find it very hard. Like, you know, I've been out in America for a couple of months. If I'm socializing, if I'm taking road trips, if I'm going clubbing and even if I'm just going to the beach for a few hours, I find it very hard to then to do it. So I don't really, I kind of realize what works for me now. So yeah. I would just use that time for maybe reading, planning projects, you know, that kind of stuff. And like, I, I, I'd much rather... I would rather work my ass off continuously for 35 days, no breaks, no alcohol, no nothing. Mm-hmm. I'd rather do that and then have two or three weeks where I just fucking rage or whatever, rather than to try and, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't work well like that. I need to be, I, I need to do everything. Or I need to do nothing. I, I know what you're saying. I'm kind of the same way. Um, but that's good though. You know, you do all the work in a month, month and a half, maybe two months. And then for the rest of your life, that's a income, you know, that's a revenue stream that possibly. Exactly. And bro, if you build up if you build up forty books, you build up forty books, and those books bring you in a grand each year. Like and, and building in for people say, oh fucking hell, building up forty books. I've done ten in four years. Mm-hmm. So, like in fifteen years time, yeah, I'm gonna have fucking forty books built up. Like it's. Do you think it's so, do you think it's harder to publish a book? Um, to your self publishing, does that mean? you think it's harder because you're probably imposing your own timeline to yourself rather than I'm, I'm assuming with a publisher, they're like, Hey, I need this many words by this, this month or whatever. No, like this. So the problem with the publishing industry is most writers are fucking like, they don't adhere to deadlines. Mm-hmm. They, they come in late. So with deadlines don't actually mean that much in the publishing industry because so many people fucking miss them. So I set my own deadlines. I've never missed a deadline in publishing. I never fucking will. Um, because it's your job like so the idea of missing a deadline is nuts to me um one of the reasons i wanted to self-publish was because the um i wasn't happy with the speed the publishers move at yeah Um, and i I understand why because they've got so many fucking projects going on you know but for me it was incredibly frustrating because i haven't got hundreds of projects going on so i'm like well i want to get this out there now like why do i have to wait a year to put the next book out you know it's Mm -hmm. not going to take because I looked at it from my point of view of what I was like as a reader. As soon as I finished one book in a series, if it was good, I wanted the next fucking book. I didn't want to, didn't want to wait a fucking year. Yeah. You know. So um, yeah, but I'm still doing traditional publishing too. I'm doing I'm doing both. So I have books that uh, I have books that are coming out with traditional publishers, and I have books I'm intending to. Basically, my Roman series um, is um, is going to be the one that I'm self publishing, and the books that I do with Vinny, um, and then. My other books, I'm going to continue uh, continue to 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 probably go down the traditional publishing route for a while. And um, you know, I have um, a Brothers in Arms paperback comes out in June. Mm-hmm. You know, so that'll be cool because it'll be in grocery stores and bookstores and things like that, which is something that you can't do with self publishing. But self publishing, you know, I have um, I had I sold the rights to a Polish. Um, publishers so even though i self-published in uh, i've self-published in english um i can sell the rights and have a traditional publisher publishing polish german italian or whatever so yeah it's kind of like all over the place i'm still finding my way with it but um it's i think that i think the important thing is if you're looking at self-publishing it's to know so for instance when i self-published legion penguin had made me an offer for the book right so I knew it was a legitimate book and I wasn't just going, Oh, I'm going to self publish cause fuck it. It's the easier one than trying to get a contract. Do you see mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I knew it was a legit book that was good enough to go into stores and bookstores. And I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try this out and self publish. It wasn't like, Oh fuck, I'm trying to sell this book. I have one book right now that nobody's interested in buying and I've considered self publishing because, uh, but I'm like, well, is it good enough? Because sometimes you can fall into a trap of they won't want to do it because it's not the right book for the right moment. Mm-hmm. So there's that. But I need to I need to look at it again and be like, maybe it's just not good enough. Yeah. You know? So, you know, you need to, like, yeah, the self-publishing thing, I think, I think it's really um, a, an underused tool for, like, a lot of people. But it needs to be, like, I, I think that a great test about it is any book you want to self-publish, see if anyone will buy it off you first. 
yeah. and then it doesn't mean you shouldn't but like at least then you know that it's not like you know it's worthy you know how do you go about like okay i wrote a book i want to contact like penguin how do you even get in who do you talk to there to be like hey, my, I got a book. My, my agent does it so you so it's best to have like an agent or somebody that oh, yeah, knows the work because they, they deal they'll do, do the contracts they know contracts they know they know what you should have in your contract they know what the market price should be they know what's selling what's not selling they know like they you know like they're they're in london or new york they're going to they're going to dinner with and drinks with these editors every night they know what they're looking for they know like an, an agent they take 15 percent. it's fucking best 15 percent you'll ever you'll ever spend who what yeah. should somebody look for in an agent if that's what they're going for me someone you're gonna like for me when i was looking for my agent i was like i want someone that this is going to be my friend for you know my agent rowan like she's my friend i love her yeah um uh, but at the same time she gives great advice so it's you know you don't just want someone that's just going to be a yes man to you she's not you know she's good she's great and she's uh um you know you you're looking for someone who's got that confidence of an expert you know when they're mm -hmm. talking you want to feel like oh this person's on top of their shit it's yeah. like because you can't be you can't you I think it's important to like, so I'll do work. Sometimes I'll, I'll bring stuff to her where I've already found the job and I'll bring it to her and she'll write, write up the contract, which I think is great. You know, you shouldn't rely on them to be going out at the end of the day. If you're not willing to chase after your own work, you know, you, sh you can't expect someone else to do it. If you're getting, if you're, if you're getting 85% and they're only getting 15%, well, what, what you shouldn't be expecting them to be the more tenacious one chasing contracts. You should be making opportunities happen. Mm -hmm, for sure. But, um, yeah, dude, I just, um, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't struggle to get an agent. I don't want this to sound like big headed, but again, it comes down to if you've done, if you like actually done the work and you have a good fucking manuscript, like as an example, someone's going to want to represent you. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing of it, oh, it's so hard to get a publishing deal. It's so hard to get an agent. It's fucking not. It's, it's only hard if you haven't, if you're not any good, if your book's if, not well, any good. No, or if you haven't done the work, people are, yeah. are impatient with it. So it's like they'll do this first draft of this idea that they haven't outlined and it's just all over the place and they haven't put any work into being a professional. They've mm -hmm. gone at it like an amateur and then they'll be like, oh, this person doesn't want to represent me. It's like, well, yeah, of course they wouldn't because why should, like, you, like, your job should be to do as much of the work as possible, right, before you hand that over. Yeah. Like, because if they're looking, they've got a hundred people coming to them looking for representation. Are they going to take the one that's going to that's going to cause them that's going to need? They're going to have to put fifty hours into a year, or they're going to take the one that they put five hours into a year? Yeah, make right? it easy for them to say yes. Yeah, exactly, mate. And like, if you do, they the publishers are always looking for fucking books. If you mm. write something good, it might not. You might not get a fucking six figure deal for it. You might not get a seven figure deal. You're definitely probably not going to get that. But you you might not even get a fifty grand deal, but you're gonna get offered something. Yeah. If you if 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 what you've written is professional, um. So people just like people just rush it, mate. They think that because it's an artistic endeavor, which it is, they forget that it's also a business. It's and like treat it like a fucking business. Do you have any like mentors within the community? And like, if you do, how do you go about finding like a, another writer that you can lean on or somebody within that that you know spectrum of whatever to talk to about so i didn't have any the only person i knew that was doing a, um that was in an artistic industry was my friend gareth who's a he's a big trans dj and he's you know he's made a lot of money he's he's been very successful um and he was the only person i knew that did like an artistic industry like that had been successful in the artistic industry so um he he but there's a lot of transfer. Well, dude, there's a lot of transfer between, like I said, business in general. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if, um, but he was, he was the first one really who was kind of like a mentor for me in that. Um, then there's been some people through whose social media, I think once you kind of show somebody that you're legit, you're a lot more likely to then have somebody's time because you can offer them something back in return as well. So there's some, uh, some authors out there who I'll talk to over um, social media um, who will give me advice here and there. Um, but I have something in return to give to them, which is, um, you know, I will I I will have promoted their books for a long time before I ever asked for a fucking advice for them. Yeah. So 
So these people have seen me giving, doing what I can to help them before I ever go to advice. When you get fucking like, I'll get approached to advice for somebody and they're not even like following you. They've never even liked the picture. They've never commented on a picture. They've never tried to, to like contribute to your kind of thing in any way. Haven't even bought your books. Like build an actual relationship. Yeah. They haven't even bought a book and they'll come in with, can you read this and let me know what you think? Oh yeah, mate. I haven't got anything going on. I'll drop everything read your, and read your manuscript. You've never even said hello to me before. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. No, I, I see. <laughs> I can imagine. I get people that hit me up all the time, but you have a, you have a lot more followers than I do. And mine are, mine are just mostly questions about the military. Uh, a lot of questions about Anglico uh, and how people can do different things in the military. But that's kind of where my mind lies. I don't yeah. really worry about it too much. Well, dude, it's like if, if I – so I try and help people out as much as possible. But I'll be like – so I'll get people – the military one's a great example. Like I'm putting things up all the time to let people know that I've got a podcast. There's even a link you know, that says in my bio on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And someone will come in and just ask me a question, sometimes without even a hi, and just being like blah, 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 blah. blah. And I'm like, have you listened to the podcast? Because we did a whole episode on this. I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, well, no, I just thought like – I'm like – Go and listen to every episode of the podcast. It's fucking four. It's 44 episodes. Go and listen to every one. I guarantee we have answered your fucking question. But I think part of that is people just don't realize how busy other people are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like if you're, if you're sitting on your ass all the day, you probably assume everyone else is. You probably like someone the, the, the other day was um, he wanted to debate like the stuff you and me were talking about, about COVID and stuff. I'm like, look, dude, there's a reason I put it on my story was because – I don't have all evening to, to debate with, with people. That's why I'll, I'll say it on a podcast or something. So it's like a, a macro thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there are certain people who I will then have certain individual conversations with. But so you've got to earn yourself into that position. Like I can't, I can't fucking phone, um, I don't know, um, Neil Gaiman, you know, like the, the author Neil Gaiman. Okay. I can't just, I can't expect to get on a phone with Neil Gaiman and say, Neil Gaiman, can I have an hour of your time, please? I haven't earned that. Yeah, you're not in his you know circle. I mean? I, I, yeah. I'm not in his circle. I'm not in his peer group. I'm not anywhere near on his level. I can't fucking ask him to have an hour of his fucking time, you know? Yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. Man, what an interesting life, though, man. You've you've gone through, you've done the military, you've done, you know, security contracting, you've gone to different war zones, you've written, what'd you say, eight books, six books? Uh, I think 10 now. 10 books, 10 books. I think, I think, I think we're on 11 right now. That's awesome, man. I mean, and you're traveling the world and which is something I say all the time that people need to do, get out and see different stuff and really makes you appreciate where you're from uh, and makes you, makes you, gives you ideas on how to improve where you're from too, because we're, mm. you know, everywhere's got a, something about it that's special and bringing some of that back to where you're from is always a good thing. Yep. Um, I think that's a great point to you because I love America. I mm -hmm. love the UK. Um, but I love myself doesn't mean that any of those things can't be improved upon. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. What do, what's your like most favorite work that you've done so far? That's a tough one. Um, I've recently, um, so I started songwriting. So I've got, um, I had a song come out the other week, which was like, uh, it was like, uh, Armin Van Buren made it like trans track of the week, which was really cool for me. Cause I've been into trans since I was like 14 years old. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. Because and then reading the comments, it's like it's like uh, a lot of people who have been like cancer survivors and stuff like that. They've kind of like picked it up as like their kind of like an anthem. So yeah. that was really cool. Um, Brothers in Arms coming out was great because um, again, I got to I feel like I got to immortalize my comrades because that book's going to be around after we're all gone. Yeah. So I kind of like that. That made me quite proud. Um, I've worked on TV stuff with my friends, which is always amazing because it's like you're working with your friends. So that's like a whole different thing to it. It's like, it's like, holy fuck. And you believe we're making TV thing together. It's just like, it's fucking nuts. Yeah, like, no, so right. there's all these, there's all the different, it's all different ones. I can't really say there's anything. I just fucking like, I, I think what I've learned now is that I used to be chasing like the million dollar fucking book deal and stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, right, what's this, mo what's the biggest commercial idea I can think of? And, I'd be chasing that. And I got very close with selling some TV shows that would have made a lot of money that fell through. And I, but, I, but I wasn't, none of, I, none of them were any things that I really wanted to be doing. 
it was like I was chasing a check. And what I've realized in the last couple of years is working with my friends is fucking awesome. So I try and work on as many collaborative projects with my friends as I can. Um, so right, right now I'm writing a script with a few of them where there's me and one of the guys who are writing a script and then some of the other guys can be producers and some of the other guys can be actors and, um, you know, probably make hardly any money off it, probably lose money on it, but it doesn't matter because it's like making something with your fucking friends. Like this fucking dope. Yeah. Um, and writing what I want to write and yeah. make a lot less, less money than I could like if I, if, cause I can write anything that I really turn my hand to. So I could make like, if I just ghost wrote for other people and just ghost wrote commercial stuff, I could make a, like a really nice living. I'd rather earn less money and, um, you know, just write what makes me happy. Kind of do what you want. Yeah. Do, no. it, do, you, do it one, but also write what you want. You know? Yeah. Cause I like you, dude, if you, if you're doing any kind of writing for a job, you're already winning. Like it's a fucking great way to make a living. But I just think like for that extra bit of money in the, uh, like that extra bit of money, I was going to say in the bank, it wouldn't be in the bank. It'd be in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> it would be out my hands, but like, it would like, it's just collaborations with friends is just, is just like the way that I'm trying to do my business now and try and do my art. It's just, what can I work on with a friend? Be that a song or a movie or a book. I want to work with mates. Yeah, for sure, man. That's kind of why I like doing what I'm doing right now. I'm uh, going to school and getting myself up to, to if I want to like apply to an actual publishing company or something as a writer or, or as a journalist or something like that or in advertising because I'm studying uh, both, then I can, but I would much rather prefer to just I would much rather continue working for myself and working with, mm -hmm. like you said, with your friends, because you have to be self-driven. I don't have to take orders from somebody that I disagree with. And if something fails then it's on me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and, yeah. and then you have to be a certain kind of person to do that though, because you have to be able to be willing to take responsibility for the things that you do right. And the things that you do wrong and no one's going to do everything right. You know, mm -hmm. people are going to mess it up, especially doing stuff like this, like freelance work and stuff like that. You're going to mess it up. You're going to, you got to figure it out. But I think like everything else, you weather through the storm, you know, you come out on the other side and it, you, you see that it was painful, but it's worth it, you know, in the end. Um, at least that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where my mind is at right now with uh, doing the podcast. And I've got a couple other ideas that are now on hold because of this whole COVID-19 thing. I had something that I had mentioned to two of my professors and they gave me some contact info for other people because they thought it was a really good idea. Uh, both of them that are still working in the journalism community. And, but that this whole thing kind of put that on hold. So now yeah. who knows what's going to happen, but it works itself out, dude. As long as you, that's why it's so important to have multiple projects going at once. Yeah, man, for sure. That's like I said, I'm a, I'm a hot mess. <laughs> that stuff yeah. everywhere. I've put, um, right now my photography, I do photography as well. My photography is on the, on the back burner. Um, but at some point, you know, I'll bring it back out and I just got propellers for my drone. So I'm going to start flying my drone again more and, uh, we'll see what happens with that. I'll probably get interested in doing shit with that. You know, it's just, that's what happens. Yeah. I get little hobbies and <laughs> yeah. I start trying to like, how can I make money off this? Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Well, we're at just over two hours, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. You want to go ahead and, um, put out any of your social media or anything yeah. you want to promote? Thanks. Um, so we got a podcast, uh, Veteran State of Mind. Um, we have um, it's kind of just like this, dude. It's kind of like a, just fireside chat. Yeah, fireside chat kind of thing. I've got a lot of British vets on there. Um, that's that's something like, like you do. I've, I've just I just really enjoy doing that. We really enjoy doing that podcast. Um, so at Veteran State of Mind, um, if you uh, want to check out the books, then best place to find me is probably on Instagram at GRJ Books. Um, on Instagram and then like there's links through there to to everything else um, and then yeah uh, if you're interested in books about Afghanistan then Brothers in Arms uh, Garen Jones Brothers in Arms and um, well, if you go to that one that then because it's on my author page then all the other books are like a link to it too but thanks for having me on bro it's been fun it's fucking gone far, gone by fast I just realized how fucking hungry I am <laughs> no that's cool I wish we would I know we had hoped to do this in person but obviously uh, this happened so if I'll be uh, back bro I love California I'm, I'm coming back oh Don't for, worry about that. for sure you know I'll definitely come back on if I ever make it over to the uh, over to England or the UK then you know I'll have to swing by and come on yours definitely mate definitely cool. Cool, man. Uh, well, hey, everyone check out my website. It's jkramergraphics.com and I'm on Instagram at jkramergraphics. So check me out and have a good day.